All right. How are we all doing tonight? Bro, like, is it episode four or five now, technically? Five. Technically, technically five. yeah. Technically, technically five. episode five. This but is a special this is a, one. This is a special one, I was going to say, yeah. Oh, there you thank go. You thank you very much. There you go. So tonight, we've got a very special guest. Yep. All right. Rania. Hello, hello. How are you doing? <laughs> good, good. Thank you very much. No, nah, pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, no, I'm heaps excited. Yeah. She got you like right at six, at man. Six. I love it. <laughs> Even I was upstairs getting dressed. I was, like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, gotta break those uh, Arabic stereotypes of being late all the time. Look, um, <laughs> I still rock up late to work. So. <laughs> well, me too, me too. But like every now and then I do like... Yeah, just gotta be know, a bit more. Break like, the routine. There you go. Sorted. <laughs> well, I feel like I want you to introduce yourself. Tell us more about yourself. What's uh, what br- what what do you think is the um, is the first thing that you'd say when when someone asks you about yourself? Ooh, there's a couple of things. Um, so first of all, I've got uh, my career as a scientist. So I have been working as a research assistant for four years at, in Liverpool, and I am currently doing my PhD in a specific project in immunology so mm. looking at the immune system and like specific cells in the immune system and how we can manipulate them to try to save people from using immunosuppressants um so in conditions like autoimmune disease so you've got people who have for example type 1 diabetes um there's a disease called multiple sclerosis where all the time your immune system is basically attacking your own mm. body yeah. And these people have to take a lot of immunosuppressants to suppress the immune system and to, you know, go on about their life. But the problem with the immunosuppressants is that you are suppressing the entire immune system. So you mm-hmm. have nothing to protect you from, like, any other disease. You're more compromised. Yeah, the and infections yeah, yeah. and things like that. So that's what we're looking at. So that's my first thing. I'll be like, I'm a scientist. <laughs> and then I also do love um, singing and acting. Uh, for my singing, it's basically in Arabic and some Turkish as well. Um, I've been like, I have an Insta page, so if you want to follow me on Rania Tunes. <laughs> and I will put it in the link. Like, yes, yeah. and I've, I've performed a couple of times in like local festivals and like cultural things here in Australia. Mm. And uh, I personally was born in Sweden and I came here when I was 18 back in 2012. So yeah, that's me in short. Three things. <laughs> nice. So what, you're 29, 28? 29, turning 20, 30. There you go. Yes. Massive achievement. Absolutely. Definitely. Look, honestly, it's always a pleasure to have such wonderful talent in the Thank community you. coming through because we tend to not lack, but we're not really this, what's the word, vocal about it. Everyone's just like doing their own thing. Yeah, because we're so spread as well. You don't know who, what's, who's doing what and yeah. where and things. But I'm pretty sure we have quite a few talents, and big ones. Like every now and then they pop up on Facebook and you see their achievements, uh, whether it's doctors, scientists or whatever. Like we have, we have people that We do, we do, which is, which is a good, I guess, good sign for the future. Yeah. Uh, especially in such countries where you do have a lot of freedom. Mm. Um, I think we forget that we're pretty much one of the luckiest countries. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. But what made you move from Sweden? Oh, 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 oh. so I don't want to, you know, talk bad stuff about my home country. No, oh, yeah. But um, <laughs> the beautiful country, Australia, uh, is definitely much better than Sweden. The can of worms have been opened, bruv. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Vibes. I'm, I'm not going to go into <laughs> more detail. People that are close to me know, and I always like talk about it and whinge. But um, Australia is definitely, like, I loved it. As soon as I entered, I felt like, oh, my God, I this is a country I can call home, a country that I can adopt the accent. Like, if you heard me talking in Sweden, although I was born there and I was from the south, I didn't have the actual Swedish accent because mm. we were so segregated. My entire class for like eight, nine years was all people who had been born in Sweden or came when they were like at the age of six mm-hmm. and seven. And we all felt so separated from the actual Swedish community. Why were you guys in the South? Was it because like that's just... That's one of the main places where you have Iraqis. Um, there's a city called Malmö. Is oh, mama, yeah, yeah, my cousins are there. Yeah, yes, yeah. I remember exactly. going there and I, I was, was depressed after fucking two weeks. Yeah, weeks see, yeah. see, I freaking my first depression episode came when I was in year seven. Right, I was looking <laughs> out the window at school and I was like, oh my god, I think I think I'm feeling depressed because it was like it's just like it's always snow. Autumn. Like no, yeah. I love the snow. Actually, no. I wish it was snow. It's the grayness. We had so much rain and grayness all the time. There's this, no sunlight. 
There's no yeah. sunlight. Or is and it's what's the opposite? Like, sunlight, sunlight is very important. Like, you get your yeah. serotonin, you get your, like, like yeah, all your exactly endorphins yeah. from just sunlight, and you don't have it there. The first few weeks at school here when I came, and I remember walking to the school, like, every day, and I was like, oh, my God, this is paradise. Just looking at the flora and the fauna of Australia and feeling the heat. Yeah. But now it's I'm cool. like, I think I'm, I've reached the level where I cannot handle those 35 degrees anymore. Without getting slightly annoyed. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. This is this the only downside of Australia. I guess. It was so humid. Like I don't know. But we spent it in Bali for a week. Eh? Oh Ooh. man. Yeah, Bali was different. Mom nearly had like a. Yeah. Mom nearly collapsed that one day. She went out. It was like fifty degrees. It was what? like she went with dad. She's like, let's go for a walk. I'm like, what? I have my wife. She comes like, we home. She's like, I can't do this. She just she jumped <laughs> in her clothes <laughs> in the pool. So I'm like, all right. Oh my like, bro, I can't imagine the people living in in those type of yeah, countries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's the tropical ones. To be honest, know. I don't know, is the, is the suicide rate quite high in those countries? Look, I, I don't know what's going on. Like these days, I'm seeing posts on Instagram. They're like, oh, the happiest countries, Denmark. And I don't know what. I'm like, are you sure? And then I read the comments and people are like, what are you talking about? We are like dying here from all the yeah. depression. Far what what happens? Far so out. I remember my dad tried to go to Sweden at one point because... Um, from Iraq? No, so I'll tell you. The so I was born in Iraq. Then we went to Jordan for five years. Okay. And then in those five years, dad was like, I need to get to Europe because his brother's all there, mm. right? So two of his brothers are in Sweden. I think one's in Germany, mm. one's in the Netherlands. They're just like all around that. Yeah. So then he was like, all right, let's, um, let's get like, let me try it. So he, he attempted twice and he got declined. Mm. And then of like half of the yeah. Jama'at. And then got caught somewhere and then came back to, to Jordan. Thank God. So and then he applied and then we got to Australia. And he was like, so lucky. Yeah, uh, that <laughs> is just, that. Like, bro, you guys that is a blessing, bro. No, like, idea. Yeah. no idea. Yeah, and it's like then he applies to Australia. Then his uncles are here mm. from mom's side, uh, from his mother's side, and he's like, you know what? This is the it's perfect. And then we get we came here, and this was just like I'm like, this is amazing. This is quite well. Like it sucks that I guess we don't have our cousins here, mm. but I like you build amazing relationships with the people around you, regardless. Anyway, I think and like. It's been such a blessing being in this country. Like, well, yeah. we grew. We, I didn't. I wasn't born here. What age did you come? Ten. Oh, ten. So, ten. You, do you remember your life in Iraq? I do remember shukak, like shukak. Apartments, really? Yeah. I thought we didn't have apartments. Nah, today. because we were living in Baghdad. Because Dad used to work in like one of the like, yeah. you know, like I don't know if we should be talking about it, but it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an old regime. We can talk about it. Yeah. So Dad like was used to be part of the Mukhabarat back in the day. Like oh. he used to be. Like oh. that's what was his part of his job, right? Like oh. uh, what is that? It's like a I guess like a manager, I guess. It's like yeah, well he's up there, yeah. He's up there. Like yeah. So what a bank? Yeah. Bank, yeah. So like he was like he was in charge of these yeah. sort of like yeah. very high end sort of jobs. Okay. So we had to move to Baghdad for it. Mm -hmm. And we lived in a place called Haysadam. <laughs> yeah. So it was Shukak, like just yeah. Shukak. But like it was all protected, like you'll have like you'll have your own like driver, a complex, yeah. a complex and oh. no one would talk to you because it's like my hadith harash because mukhabarat. And like, yeah, the boys. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the life, you know? And then, you know, like things happened and he left. Mm. Uh, but what I remember, I remember the, the good times, you know. Mm. It was for us, it was a good time because we as Mandais were pacifists. We didn't go around hunting the 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 religion regime. I guess we do have a few communists in the country, fair enough. But the majority of us were just stuck on their job, either jewellery or doctors or engineers, and that's an engineer by trade. Mm. So he focused on that, and he gave us a really good life. So I do remember, I remember the, the kindergarten, uh, I remember a bit of the um, bit of like the actual apartment, and then we went, we went to Jordan for five years, and that was terrible. That was the worst time ever. Did you go to school in Jordan? Or? I did. Oh. My older brother... So there's a so that's me and then we've got Rewan who's 2007. I'm 95 and Re, my safe is 88. 88. Yeah. Mm. So there's a seven year gap between me and my older brother who he missed out on high school and oh. primary school. Mm. So he was pretty much thrown into full time work from the age of 11. Oh. And he came in as like well, it's too late, so he just continued down that ra uh, track. Mm. Um, so I was blessed enough to focus on it, right? Mm. But it was tough. Yeah. It was very tough. So I, I don't know about your parents, like. Did no, they did not go through that. Route. So, like, you guys... It was completely different. When did you guys move? Uh, so, my parents moved separately. Like, they met in Sweden. Yeah. My mom was 18 when she left Iraq mm. with her two other brothers. They went to That's Lebanon. That's thinking, so young. Thinking that they'd come back after a week. But then they left and they never came back. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, 79. 
Yeah, that's like right <laughs> before the, uh, the Iraq the Iran, Iran war. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's uh, so my mom's family is from Basra, mm. and they were you know at the center of that Iran Iraq war. So later on, they didn't even know if their family had made it or not. Um, so my mom had like a whole trip through the whole Europe almost. So she spent six years in um, Russia studying with one of her brothers because the other one left to Yemen. And then um, after those six years, back to Syria for a year and then back off to Greece thinking that she will go to Europe from there. Mm, that's but an interesting trip. So yeah. what did she study in Russia? Um, teaching. Teaching. It was just like a random thing. It wasn't really like what she wanted, but you couldn't really choose much. Ah, there. okay. So, so yeah. Russia. So, and then your all, her older brothers, one was in Yemen? Yeah, one was sent off to Yemen and the other one stayed with her, but he was in another city in uh, Russia. Why was he sent to Yemen? It was just uh, for another studying thing. Oh, so they were just studying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th- that's how you got out initially. But then, obviously, yeah. the goal was to find a place where you can stay permanently. And then you guys ended up in Sweden in what year? Uh, my mom got there when she, I think, 93, 92, just like two years before I was born. Wow. And, yeah, my dad left in the 80s. So he actually did see some of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, but then he ran away and he went. He was in Iran for a year. Um, so when Khomeini died, Damn. and uh, <laughs> yeah, then where did he go? He also went jumping around a little bit of those uh, Soviet Union countries for like months, a couple of months there, here and there. And then he came to Sweden in 1990. Yeah. And yeah. then they met. Yeah, they met. They met through a mutual <laughs> friend, and they made. <laughs> Ranji. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. I will tell you stories of those Soviet countries compared to like Iraq and Iran and all that kind of stuff. Like, do they have? Do they oh have stories of? Yes, my mom. Yeah. My mom. She like she tells me how shit condition that country was in, like Soviet Union. Like the yeah. poverty was on a whole different level. There was no food. Um, she said pretty much in those six years she might have had like fruit a couple of times, if <laughs> any. Meat, no meat. Um, they stand in like long queues mm. to get bread. Um, of course, the weather as well, so cold. And yeah, it was pretty bad condition. And like the people were so starved that when they see something coming from like the outside, like she said, they used to get all like excited about the colored bags that we would get yeah, from yeah. like us, like yeah. relatives in Kuwait or whatever. If they send us anything, they would be like all excited about the colored full bags. Or the buttons on the clothes, because it was that bad. It was, yeah, it was quite bad. Uh, man. They Communism. like they just wanted to get out, like the people from. Communism it. was terrible at these countries. Like it was in those countries. Yeah, I think they just didn't know how to handle the situation and the fact that they always had, you know, America, you know, thinking about it and how they're gonna conquer it. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about the Cold War before. Yeah. Like most of their money was just. Put into for that military, exactly. That's what my mom says. She's yeah. like, they literally were only, you know, putting money on those things, and not caring about feeding anyone. Um, and even sending, like, the thing is, Russia was at the center of Soviet Union. So That's they right. were yeah. sending money to the little republics for, I don't know what reason, but they were giving to the republics more than they were keeping for their yeah, own. Yeah, because they had to, they had to, because there was the, um, what was it? There were like all these aristocrats. Mm. back in there and mm. they were all running different areas and mm. part of it was handing money to the republics mm. but the other part was also that those aristocrats practically mm. ran the whole like regime right yeah. they owned all the infrastructures oh okay so uh, they just owned everything from oil to banks to everything and that was part of the reason why everyone was going nuts, like, yeah. nuts because yeah. everything would go to them yeah and, and then it would just like, trickle down to like the smaller smaller like find that stuff to the to the population so how long was your mom there for? Six years. Yeah. Yeah. Just 12 years yeah. and just freaking two countries that she didn't even end up staying in. Yeah, it was like Jordan <laughs> for us. Jordan was <laughs> terrible. Like yeah. it was, it wasn't terrible. It was like, when you look back, it was a good time because it really made you more resilient. Like, like, yeah, I think so, yeah. But when I talked to dad, dad was like, you really had to be resilient. Like there was a lot of people that just gave up, turned back, put their stuff in the cars yeah. and just drove back across the border yeah. to Iraq. Yeah, I know a couple of stories where people were like, that's it. Yeah, no, fuck it, I'm out. Yeah, back. exactly, and that's the And then problem. you have the relatives on the other side, like, no, no, don't go back. Because once you're in Iraq, you bro, like, it's really unlikely that you get a visa to get out. Yeah. You have to be, you have to prove that you're a refugee yeah. or like, that, hey, I'm running away for certain mm. reasons. Yeah. Um, and some people just couldn't handle it, especially that, like, you're broke. Mm. How are you going to How are you going to live? Like, there's, if, the, if you get caught by the, if you get caught by the cops, mm. 
you um you get deported straight away because oh. most of us are on temporary visas. Mm. So I remember at one point it was like three years into it, we had to go to like Thailand for like a week to renew oh. the to renew the bloody <laughs> visa. So we went to Thailand. And I remember all I see is just like cockroaches being barbecued on the road, and I was like, oh, what the hell's this shit? <laughs> so I remember, yeah, we were there for like for a week, and then we came back because you had to renew the visa, otherwise you couldn't get in. Mm. Man, it was tough. But what we sort of picked up from my family is just like you just had to be resilient. You really had to build a lot of courage to go through all this. But I think for our for our situation or for dad's that situation, if he if he went back, it wouldn't have been good for him. Oh yeah, and because half of his maids in. got killed. Yeah, yeah, half of his maids got like just murdered so and executed. He was wanted. He was like not wanted, but because old regimes, it was like just because you're just part of the old regime, they just wanted to clear everyone out. But wait, which year was this when you went into Jordan? Two thousand. 2000. So it was well, three years before the war. No, so as the war kicked off, so you had 9-11 happen, and two years after all the things that happened, yeah. he, had, he, had, he had a lot of oh, mates that got okay, killed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of mates got killed. Yeah. Because um, it was just racism. It was either cleansing racism or just malicious. Random, random stuff. People were just getting killed. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So, like, I think part of it was that dad just wanted to have a better future. And part of the time mm. we have a child, and we're like, how did you give everything up? 39 or 38 mm, after reaching the pinnacle of your career and everything and how'd you give it up he's like for you guys mm. so like you we got like you have big shoes to fill it's not easy so like your parents went to sweden mm. right and then yeah, so yeah, you guys yeah. left at 18 you left like pretty much yeah. right back at 18 what made you make the move to australia though uh, so it was always the dream actually my mom also had like a couple of uh, rejections in the 80s where she was because she already had um, like relatives here, her mm. uncles mm. and aunties, and she wanted to come here, but she couldn't before she got married. And then my dad also turned out that he had the same dream of like leaving the Scandinavian yeah. country to whatever Canada or even he thought about um, England for a while. But um, then when we got a chance, we jumped on it and I was like, yeah, I was so happy. Was it easy to get in at that time? Like, did you have to like... No, for, for we, like we waited for two years for the um, visa because we applied from Sweden. So did you have to like uh, forgo your um, your Swedish citizenship? No, no, we can keep it. So we've kept it. We and can you, got, have to you got a PR here or you got like a citizenship yeah, now? Yeah, so we dual citizens. Oh, well, there you go, yeah. And it's good two countries because I think the Medicare is linked and stuff and all that. No, I don't. Oh, maybe, maybe it is, but we didn't f- like we didn't use that. So Not much, eh? Yeah. But look, at the end of the day, so what did your dad do for work? Over in Sweden, yeah. Oh, he worked a couple of different things: taxi driver, bus driver, and those two main things. Yeah. And Hustle he had a convenience hustle. store for a while, but that didn't go very well. So yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, man. Like my dad, when he moved, he wanted security, oh, okay. cleaning, mm. and n- now he's just a driving instructor. So like it's it's nice to have those chats with people that you can sort of relate to like shit we do similar stuff it's good it's yeah, nice yeah. it's uh it makes you bond stronger with your community members as well so I'm pretty sure like all of us have the same yeah it's all the same like, man. those stories are very like common very with common with people with, like, the very ethnics common. it's very yeah. common it's like we yeah. came here we've done nothing and yeah our parents yeah. had to like work so hard to just survive and make their family survive do you guys have family or you yeah yeah i've got my grandma my mom's mom and uh i actually have three uncles now my mom's side but my dad's family are mostly in sweden still mm. like all the close ones but he has a few distant relatives as okay well. yeah, fair, fair, fair. yeah so decent amount of family yeah, yeah. and so the work how how many years into the PhD now? Uh, this well, I will complete my first year next month. Nice. Is it three years? It's three years, yeah. But mm. you probably have to apply for ex- extension. Because <laughs> half point. the time you're like, oh, I don't want to do the work. <laughs> no, it's like I actually had a due date, due deadline today. I had to submit my literature review for the initial um, review. Shit. Yeah. So, yeah How process. do you feel about it? Oh, oh, oh. Like you want to die, but then as soon as you hit that submit button, you're like, yes. I can live again. Relief. The relief. <laughs> the relief. So it's so autoimmune, uh, so autoimmune diseases. Autoimmunity and transplantation because it, it relates. It's the same problem it's where you problem. have the immune system attacking things that you don't want it to attack. And what are you guys working on? Is it like a, uh, what sort of drugs or medications? No drugs, no medications. We are working uh, with a specific cell in the immune system called the T regulatory cells. Oh, yeah, they are responsible for dampening unnecessary immune responses. Sure. Normally they will do their job pretty good mm. but you have those issues in autoimmunity where they don't know they can't recognize what's self from non-self mm-hmm. so they start attacking self 
And in transplantation, they start attacking the transplant that you've just given to the person. Mm. So we want to try to manipulate those cells to make them better at like, you know, dampening the immune response when you want it to be dampened. So that's our main goal, like natural sort of therapy. So natural immunity in terms of like enhancing, enhancing but what's the what's the therapy like? What are you, what's what are you guys how you looking at making those changes so in the body? So you have to the thing is um, with those um, cells you have to make them in a lot of numbers like you have to give them to the body. So the idea is to take some blood out of your body, mm. um, enhance those cells, make them recognize the things that you want them to recognize to not initiate an immune response against. Okay. And then you want to make them in a lot of like great numbers so that you can put them back in the body and they will actually have an effect. Otherwise, if you put them back like less than what is needed, they won't do anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you take it out, they take you it enhance out. them. Mm. What's the enhancement process? Oh, I can't tell you. <laughs> oh, that's, that's all part the of the PhD. Uh, yeah. recipe. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what, what we're trying to find out. The recipe to make them better and make them grow you in guys, culture. You guys like think you're in close? Uh, no, I don't think so. People have been doing stuff uh, f- since 2005, 2004 maybe. They've and been trying to grow them yeah. outside, like in the lab. But um, there's always issues that you don't, you know, expect. It's a, it's a, a lot of underlying genetic component to it. And, like, yes, you can introduce those cells back into the body because mm. they self, so they'll, they'll, the body will not attack them, I assume, because it's, it's antigens are pretty much practically the same as the body, right? Mm. You're not making any changes to that. What is that again? So the antigens, yeah. so the person's antigens will not, will not cross-react uh, cross with those uh, reintroduced cells, right? Uh, yeah, you it mean like sh- it like shouldn't attack it? it. Shouldn't, no, right? no, no, because it's coming from the same yeah, exactly. person. Yeah, exactly. Now, what happens like when you reintroduce them, right? Like you give your body, it's it's like I'm thinking about it. It's some sort of like a vaccine, I guess, right? Like it's, yeah, it, yeah, pretty like, much. Like it's um, you're giving the body a message. Hey, these mm. these are the cells that you should be making in the future, right? Mm. But then, if your underlying genetic component is practically like I guess compromised, yeah, then. I think it all goes down back to the genetics and how can we manipulate the, g- the genetics in a way to, to to maybe fix that problem in autoimmunity. Because mm. autoimmunity is a huge net after all. Yeah, but you know what? With autoimmunity, the thing is they are thinking that it's not so much your genetics, rather it's your environment. So they're looking at how, why is it that there is more autoimmunity happening in Western countries mm. than there is if you go to poor countries. So there is something called hygiene hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. You've heard of that? I loved it. First time I heard about it. It's like why people have more asthma, why people have more allergies. It's too clean. Too fucking clean clean for you in this country. Yeah, Yeah, so our immune system is not, you know, getting a chance to practice and train itself. And there's no resilience with it. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not. Easy. It's not. It's like from the. It's like the moment the baby pops out, you just jab him. Here you go. Here yeah, you go. Here just, you go. Just After give every, them insects yeah. and I don't know what. <laughs> like just, just hey, this is this Let is one. This is eight. It's like, like it's good, but I, I feel like in third world countries we don't have the same problems in terms of. Um, I mean, I don't know how good the medicine is there. We shouldn't mm. be. We shouldn't be too judgmental no, about. I think it. it's mm. more of like the long term mm. implications of it because if you're if you're just like we've only been doing it for like what thirty. 20, 30 years, like that type of culture where it's just vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Mm. If if we can turn that for 100, 200 years, like where, where's our immunity going to be? Like what's it going to look like? So I think it's more or less of comparing third world to first world. It's more just like the long-term implications of of that, of just other over immunity on, in, in white people or whatever, whatever you guys say. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Like there's a lot of things that you are giving your body and you're changing the natural ways. Yeah. So you don't know exactly where it's going to end up. I mean, don't yeah. get me wrong, like with this modern technology hasn't been around for long, especially yeah. with all yeah. the... Yeah, so we don't, have, yeah. we don't yeah, have yeah. anything to compare and to see what is the end result after all of these introductions. Yeah, it's like I always talk about the long implications of Shisha and um, what's the other one? Um, vaping. Vaping. vaping, yes. And it took oh us 40, 50 years to identify the risks with lung cancer with smoking, yeah. Yeah. right? I remember back in the 50s, even they used to use even x-rays to measure people's feet size right what and then they realized like five ten years ago the guy's like leg would just be <laughs> so le- so yeah. like mutated to the point that they had to chop it off oh right? my goodness. so um then they realized hey i mean x-ray does cause radiation <laughs> and it causes mutation maybe yeah. we could stop using it so same yeah. with this smoking was the same problem it took a while to identify the risk factors and now it's very well established mm. perhaps with these sort of things especially the gene hypothesis like the hygiene hypothesis yeah. sorry, i think it will take 
like at least a generation before we truly realize the the implications to our society because we mm. are clean freaks in this country yeah. and part of the reason why we probably avoided such a massive outbreak with covid in comparison mm. to other countries mm. is because we have strict regulations in this country and we're very lucky to be we're mm. very lucky to be um to be to be i guess in this country part of it is the fact that our medicare covers for a lot of it and i'm one of the people that support medicare because i know once it goes private a lot of people will struggle i just read like a thing today that apparently blood tests will become mm. you'll have to pay for soon they're arguing because the, the the um the pathology centers are not getting paid enough from the government mm. and we order so much like i get patients every day i order like a bunch of bloods for them <laughs> that's all free man yeah. so now they realize like, yeah, let's on. test everything for you yeah and they come in even in gp lands like one of the things that i get annoyed by is people coming in and requesting certain things where there's no indications for that's it that's what i do because I've Googled before and I know what I'm looking for. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. For, now I have to fucking sit there and try to justify why man, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I had a guy once come in. He was like worried about his kids because he got autism and he wanted to worry. He wanted to like measure homocysteine levels and all this sort of stuff. Ooh. Which I was very educated. Yeah, well, he thinks he was. So And I was like, bro, like, it took me 45 minutes of discussion to, to tell him these things, there's no direct, like it's a neurophysiological developmental issue. Okay, or a halt. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do. He's like, oh, I started taking homocysteine. I improved with my mental health. I proved that. Oh. I'm like, mate, placebo. People don't even understand yeah. the idea of placebo, right? Like, it's hard for you. I can't convince someone of something. Like, it's just, yeah. <laughs> and you just said, be like, oh, B12, it comes in this form and that form. That <laughs> form is. I'm like, bro, I don't get paid enough for this. Like, I can't. And so, I like, honestly, when it comes to this sort of stuff, because I'm a mixed billing center, I end up charging him the higher item because you've taken my time. I'm educating you, right? A lot of times they're coming already fixated because they research things on Google. And I'm like, bro, fuck's sake, man. Like, just, just stop. Why don't you respect us educated patients? No, they don't. Like, I'm like, I, I, but it's not your area of expertise. <laughs> but what if we don't trust that you know what's going on in our bodies? I'll tell you. you I'm, one of those I'm one of those clinicians who's like, bro, I don't know. Right, mm. I mean, look at it and come back next time I see you. I will tell you what I found out. Right, but for the majority of people who come in, it's like I want insulin resistance levels, all that. And I'm like, yeah. like is it like sensitivities in your insulin? Like, yes, it, it gives you an indication whether you're gonna get like diabetes, mm. but there's a better indicate, better, better, like better uh, marker. Mm. But people just don't understand it because why should they? It's, it's, they just look at the first thing that yeah. pops up on Google. So it's a bit of a head. We're gonna see more of that. Say, we're gonna see. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're gonna see more of that coming into like the next. Yeah, yeah, I know. Century, a lot, bro. A lot of us are doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you go to uni for six, seven, eight years, and you mm. try to come out educating the public, but yeah, I think but Google says you're wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, go. Yeah. you yeah. go through and try to prove people's why the COVID jab works, and then they come back and tell you no, it doesn't work because it's like it's. Yeah. I'm like, oh, remember that time when there was a lot of um, conspiracy theories at that time yeah, for the mm -hmm. COVID jab. The guy was like, it's full of. It was a guy that we used to work with in the, in the music industry. Because I used to, I used to, we used to work in the Lebanese like music industry, like drumming and stuff. Oh yeah. So you'll get all these people that think they've done their research, mm. right, on the COVID jab, and part of it was, what was it? It's like it's a high level of aluminium or mercury in there, and I just sat there. I'm like, no. He's like, yes, I looked at this website. I'm like, they've excluded mercury from there, and he just he just couldn't argue it. I'm like, they've excluded mm. it. It's not there anymore. But try to reason with these people. Right, who go around and influence the public. That's mm. the big one. Like in your area, I think you don't have to worry about it, right? Because you're just having your PhD done. Mm. But if you sit down with the general public, right, they are so far more, what's the word? Resistant. Resistance and yeah. also like very, what's the word? Like, naive? Yeah, not naive. Like it's. Fuck, I love it. Insult them. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just like they question the validity of your method. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, why? Like, like it's 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 like he thinks I just got my like my paperwork from like just my what next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think I think it's like what would you rather some like a, a culture that doesn't question anything? Yeah, you know, like I understand, but there's uh, there are people that think like it's there's right. pros and cons with the fact that we have all this you know knowledge and facts and information readily available. It's good. Like people are learning a lot, but at good, the same right. time they're also sort of like easily sidetracked and yeah. easily misled into other things that whatever google wants you to believe so i think you know it's bad and good at the same time i think the most important thing is maybe teaching the children these days to to be more critical in their thinking mm. we're missing that in our education i oh know we had that in sweden i must say 
they were always like already from Eton, they were like, you have to critically assess your um, resources and, uh, you know, I think you guys judge. I think Sweden they, has one of the highest education. The thing is time? over there, so we don't have final exams. So I was shocked right. when I came here for year 12 and they were like, Did yes. you just need year 12 straight from Sweden? Yes. So the thing is, I finished year 11 in Sweden. Yeah. But I came here, it was July. Yeah. So they were about to have their preliminary exams. They can't just chuck me in the year 12 because they were almost done. Yeah. So I had to like stay through the last two months of year 11 and then I transferred to year 12. But I was shocked when they told me because the first thing, like it was July and they were like, next month we're having final exams. I was like, it's final exams. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're going to be assessed on the whole book. And I'm like, excuse me, what type of memory do you think I have? <laughs> Bro, that was, that was traumatic for me back then. He's in year 12 at the moment. Oh, that, oh my goodness. Nearly that, we've got like six months. Good thing you're alive and you can do a podcast. I was freaking <laughs> drowning in No, no, because I like him. I like him. Obviously, I love my brother. Obviously, but I like his <laughs> approach, <laughs> right? He doesn't. Care. He doesn't want to get into medicine, which is thank God. I'm like, bro. Yeah, yeah. I used I, to, but I convinced myself, like, nah, you know what? You know, it's not worth. It. I lost five kilos in the HSC week exam. I tell you what, yeah. it was terrible. Um, you wanted. He wants to do psychology, right? So mm. it's a bit. It's a bit more flexible, right? But he just. He's sort of like a bit more too laid back, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. this period. It should be like it should be stress. Mm. But I don't know. I guess I'm just too. Not late. feeling it. <laughs> it's just. It's Wait, not well, justifiable. It's in April. You don't have much enough. Do you yeah. guys still have trials? Yeah, trials are in August. Yeah. So they're coming up, yeah. Oh, but, okay. you know, like, the school was helping a lot. Like, the school carries a lot really? of... Our, like, they literally just hand out past papers. The whole period we do past papers. Like, they yeah, help you a they lot. Yeah, they do, but they just, like, here, do it. Yeah. I'm like, what's they're, that going to help not, Yeah, because they've given... Like, in this point in U12, mm. then we're not learning I know, it's more like content. revision, revision, yeah. revision. You know? So, you know, hopefully... We'll yeah, I remember. Study everything again, again like, over the <laughs> six-month period. I was literally cramming the night before every exam. <laughs> I remember I was so lucky for chemistry. There was like, we were doing communication for the option, like whatever it's called. Is that chemistry or biology? Was it communication for biology? Yeah, I Maybe it was. We I remember we had it was like to the eyes, the, the ears. The sound traveling through the ear and you have to know the pathway. And I was cramming it the night before and it came. It came it as a came question. Us. What was that? I can't um, remember where I was, yes. but it was, yeah, I remember, I remember one subject. It was ancient history. I fucking blazed like the the call modules, and I, I had a week to know the whole module. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd wake up at like three p.m. and I'll cr- I'll study until three a.m. and it was like twelve hours for like six days, and I was writing on the wall at one point because I was like, "Fuck, oh, that's yeah, too I much, bought, man." I bought a whiteboard and no, no, no. I was writing on the wall, <laughs> writing on the walls, yeah. on like, the wall. Know, so no I damage. was I was like, wake up, and it was just like it was all there and. Um, yeah, look, I was happy with the mark at the end. It was good. <laughs> I was happy. It was like, I got what I needed to get. He's a doctor now. So yeah, <laughs> so it was somehow. Uh, but it was, it was terrible. Because yeah. you think it was like, it's do or die. There's nothing, Literally. there's nothing after that. Then you're like. Although it's not true. Like people actually still manage. Like they had the freaking mystery marks and still ended up, you know, at uni because somehow you can do like some. There's college. There's, it's so different just, now. Yeah. Like it, for me. No, it was like that already, I think, but they weren't educating it that much. So we didn't know. Like it was like you get to uni or there's nothing else. You know what I mean? That's the problem. I think the problem is that there are too many pathways now, right? Mm. I think it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But a lot of people don't know what they want to do. Yeah, that's another problem. That's another problem. Which is hard. I really, I really have a lot of empathy for you guys mm. because, yeah, like yeah. half the time you have no idea what the fuck you're doing. Like, you, how how can you figure out what you want to yeah, do in sixteen? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Like you're not meant to know. That's that's what I I argue with. Like not teachers because teachers they are empathetic towards us as well. I yeah. good parents mm. with p- parents of like our generation. They're mm. like, oh, you have to know what you want to do. How do you not know? Like you're seventeen. Why? I'm like, you're not meant to know. You're not meant to know. That's that's the thing. It's like they. They compare it to how they, when they were teenagers and, and the world that they lived in compared to our world where all everything is self discovery. It was yeah, simpler. Yeah. Like yeah. now you have so many like new professions that were not, didn't exist before. Like you have all these things about like technology and yeah, like it's all marketing. Yeah, AI and technology. It's so much. Like there's so many options. Like until today, I'm in science and I still don't even know about all the professions that I can possibly take post-PhD. Yeah, you don't know. Are you, try, are you planning to teach at uni? That was my initial thing that I wanted to do. When I first did my honours, I was like, I want to become an academic and I'm going to lecture at uni. But now maybe I don't want to because it's not just lecturing. You have to also do more research, research and always applying for grants and funding. 
which is very hard. Do you want to suck up to the uni? For like every, every no, that's not the thing. Okay, you have to actually suck up to all the, cause the whole community. <laughs> <laughs> the scientists and everybody has to be like on On your side and stuff. Otherwise. Them. otherwise, they can kick you out. Like there's a lot of horror stories. You get excommunicated. People, <laughs> people who had to leave their place just because um, there was some politics going on. Um, it's very similar in medicine. It's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Everywhere. It's like medicine, doctors, clinicians like and all that. It's, it's very similar. Medicine is much more... Um, yeah, I think so. Much more sort of yeah. toxic. Yeah, I don't know mm. why. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, I don't probably don't want to do that. I want something more research, but also, like, commercialized. So, I don't have to worry about, you know, the next year where I'm going to be working. I want something that Just is Just work in a private company. I think permanent. private companies will love you. Pharmaceutical Yeah, company. they will love you. Just yeah, that's... But I don't want to be just a seller. So I want the research part of it, but also at the same time somehow commercialised. So and you would have done three years of medical science, right? Uh, yes, biomedical. Biomedical. Yeah, and then honours year one. Where was where was the medical science? Uh, um, the biomedical and the honours were both at UTS. And UTS, okay. Yeah. And then you just got straight into PhD after? No, I was working for four years. Oh, nice. What did you yeah. do? That's as a research assistant. Just research So in the same group that I'm doing my PhD at the moment, I've been working with them okay. for four years. Um, and now I'm with UNIS W for the PhD. Cool. So yeah. you, did, you didn't do a master's? No, you don't have to. Oh. That's the good thing about Australia. You don't have to. It's enough with just one year of honours on top of your undergrad yeah. and you can get into Because PhD. master's is two years. Yeah. Where honours is one, other but you've got to smash the honours. Other countries, yeah. they do master's and then they can get into PhD, but we don't have to. But the honours yeah. is only Australian. That's yeah. what I've been told. So it's that's not, not recognised. Yeah, that's so a problem. So I was like, e if I want to do research, even like I was looking at, you know, doing research in Sweden, mm. um, just, you know, for the funds. <laughs> but uh, they probably wouldn't have recognised my uh, actual uh, degree. But after you did get a PhD, it's easy. Yeah, to after around. PhD, that's, that's and international. And you get a Dr. Ranya, bruv. Dr. Ranya, a there fake doctor. <laughs> Don't ask me for CPR or anything like <laughs> Nothing that. Nothing like that. <laughs> no, nah, it's good. It's, I'm glad. Look, honestly, I am very, very, like, happy that you sort of made it tonight because it's good that we encourage the female talent mm. in our community, yes. right? Like, it's a big factor that we tend to miss out on, right? Yeah. Like, as a mundane, like, mm. how did you grow up from Sweden and transition to Australia? Mm. How did you find being a mundane all of this? Where does that fit for you? Uh, it fits in the back pocket. <laughs> 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 so, um, look, uh, for me, religion has not been like a very, very big part of it. I think it's because, you know, you grow up in a European country in Sweden in a family that also was detached from their own like communities at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have like much, you know, knowledge or practices that they were doing throughout their life. And similarly, they passed it on to their children. <laughs> So I don't, like, there is not much other than I always had this thing in my head that, you know, I am representing somebody, either my country or my, like, my community as a Mandean. Mm. So it was, that was my main drive, actually, during school in Sweden. I was always like, you know, I have to be the best. I have to always, like, you know, go, do good because I'm representing people. True, true. So that was my main thing with Mandeism. Otherwise doesn't really have a lot of space in, 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 in my in, life. In your life. <laughs> what is it that you know about it? What, what you know I about know about it? So I've always thought that we are, as you were saying, very peaceful people. Mm. Um, we don't, like you don't see us engaging in violence and things like that. No, we're chill. We're just spectators, man. Well, yeah, Get our popcorn in the background. Spectators <laughs> and like quite fair people, I would say. Um, that I've always like, of course, been through a lot of stuff um, against them as a minority. But, um, like, I don't know. I don't know how to... Like, what else? What do you mean? Like, when you, when you hear, when you first were told you were a mundane, mm. what was the first thing that came to your mind? Of course, the white rusta. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the baptism. Um, You've been baptized? No, I haven't. I'm Which telling you. Which is very me. common, man. That is common. It's very yeah. common. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, okay, yeah. so that's another thing. I think our people in, like, in our religion, we're not very much strict and extreme in our followings. Mm. Um, yes, I think actually today's generations are becoming, like they're going back to the religion more than before. There was a period, I think, like the 90s and early 2000s, maybe because they were busy with other things mm. that were happening around them. But we are not naturally very, um, like... Hold, like strictly holding to our religion. We're more like very neutral people. 
I would say. And that's why we sort of lost our language, a lot of yeah. it, a bit of our culture as we transition yeah. through from Palestine to yeah. Iraq to Iran. Yeah. We Which we don't even know if we have actually transitioned because people are saying, oh, we're from Turkey. Oh, no, we're not from Turkey. I don't know. Like, I'm so lost yeah, yeah. about the origins. It's, it's yeah. um, like, it's, um, it's a, because we don't have, uh, we don't have really strict books or evidence. That's the yeah, problem. Yeah. And that's not that's no one's fault. It's no. just a lot of it got destroyed. Yeah. Right? Mm. And the ones that do have it, unfortunately, it's either we don't know them because mm. they, they are still in those countries, mm. like our home countries, or they just don't show it. Yeah, I don't we know. We don't know much I about know. it. I don't know. The language being like pretty much extinct, they can't even ask an Assyrian to translate it because it's not the same. It's like the old, old Aramaic. It's I, I, I envy the Assyrians to be yeah, I know. I'm like, man, like you gotta speak your language. Oh, you have the, like all this sort of stuff, and I was like, come on, they like they are really actually also really on the way of losing though, because I asked like one of my friends, and I was like, do your parents know how to write in Assyrian? She was like, no. So they are also slowly, slowly, slowly like wash, losing it. Why the white was and only having it as like speaking language, but they if you can't read and write, that's it. Like you're already sort of on the edge of. Well, I tell you what, like I make to me right. He's Palestinian. Mm. He's marrying a Syrian. She's very, very strict on the religion and the culture, mm. right? But I wonder how it's going to transition when the kids come around, yeah. right? Like, are you still going to teach them all the yeah, language? Yeah, yeah, all yeah. The that's when they got this. That's when it sort of starts being diluted, Fading. right? Yeah. But for us, I think it's the opposite. I think now we have an opportunity to re-establish ourselves in this country. We have, we have a lot of talent. We have a lot mm. of resources now that mm. we can access. There's a lot of research, PhD candidates, for mm-hmm. goodness sake. There's one in Adelaide. Right, he wrote an entire thesis on our history. There's a lot of room for improvement. Mm. But like you're the th- like, for example, the fact that you haven't been baptized. Mm. This is nothing new. No, it's very common. It's very common, yeah. And people don't some people don't even know their Milwasha, for example. They don't even no. know their history. They don't even mm. know why we're mundane. Like when you get asked, why are you mundane? What's your answer to that? Like who are you? If you <laughs> come around at a school, I remember because it's a very common thing. Like yeah. you ask. The only thing I used to tell them is like, oh, you know, John the Baptist, have you ever heard of him? And if they're Christians, they would have heard. If not, they don't know at all. Not even Iraqis knew what Mandian is. Yeah. So I, at, there was a point in my life where I was like, you know what, I'm just Christian. <laughs> just like, take me, it's okay. And so how long did that last before you sort of be like, hang on, no, I have an argument. Now when I came here, because I saw that there's like a big community in Liverpool. Sweden so doesn't have one? Yes, but we're not like congregated in one area, so we're very dilute. Like I will go to a school, that I will be the only Mandi in the whole school. Yeah, yeah, and like in the whole city, if you want. Sometimes also, there was one city that I was living in. I was the only one. Um, so like it's very difficult to explain it also when you don't have much information. So yeah. the only thing I could say was like, oh, there's this guy called John the Baptist who was the cousin of uh, Jesus, which is not even true. And uh, he, they... Boom. Yeah, he, Truth bomb drop, brother. <laughs> <laughs> which is true. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot There's a lot we can argue about. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of unknown. Uh, th- there's unknown. a lot of things that have been, um, how do I say it in the most nicest way, uh, mm. like uh, censored out. And By I who? know about By that. By who? By us? So... Have you read any of the Ginzas? Have you come across any of the Ginzas? No. No, okay. Nothing. So there's the Aramic. Mm. Aramic, the original Aramic, right? Mm. That one itself mm. uh, got translated to German. From German, it got translated to I English, heard about right? That. The this lady? lady was that so lady? no, Lady Drawa was one of the researchers, oh. Oh, right? Okay. She helped translate, but yeah. Gilbert, something Gilbert, this guy yeah. translated the entire Aramic German to English, right? Mm. So this is the proper, like, literal, like, like poetic Ginza. When you read, you're like, what the hell am I reading? Yeah. It doesn't, it, it was really hard to understand. Mm. They made a simplified version of it mm. in Iraq, mm. right? So Saddam came to us back in the 80s and mm. he was like, you guys need to present a book so I can protect you guys. Mm. Oh my God. So we did. But right? Like how, who helped them translate it? Because I don't so think the translation, anyone, the translation, yeah, yeah. I don't know, the translation yeah. is very consistent, right? Yeah. The priests sit, yeah. And translate every sentence. But are we sure they know exactly what they're reading? No, it is. It's the same <laughs> because it's very strict on the translation. Mm. So they have a they have a history of all the translated books. Mm. So now it's all electronic, right? Mm-hmm. But the, it's all copied from one source. Mm. That source has a date on it from the person that translated it. Right. And okay. usually, what they do is, if there is a misinterpretation yeah. in one of the quotes, they will cross it out and they pull a note and say this is incorrect based oh. on that, and then they'll rewrite it. Right, okay. but researchers and the literature like reviews out there, they will say there's a lot of a bit, there's a bit like a misconception about about the Ginza's translation at times because 
at times you'll read multiple resources and they'll, they'll, they'll be a bit different, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And it's unfortunate you can't change that. Yeah. But we know there is a date of the things that have been yeah, translated okay. across the, across the, the, the times. Mm. And the one that got translated to Arabic mm. had it's something censored out. Mm. And the reason why is because uh, we would have been prosecuted right on the spot. <laughs> we would have been wiped out, like oh, off, yeah. the, off the face of the earth. <laughs> that's how bad it is. So we kept it very peaceful. Very, very like, hey, bro, like we're, we've got one book. Half the time, the things that are in there have been translated from a Christian or a Muslim point of view in mm-hmm. terms of even describing what hey is mm-hmm. or what our God is or what our beliefs. It's because it's easier to relate to someone. Mm-hmm. And most of them have been translated by Christians originally. So that Gilbert person, he's Christian. Yeah. So he will translate based on his understanding, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. So a lot of times those verses will be Christian in nature, mm-hmm. right? Or the, the I guess... They will come across as more yeah. Christian in, in poetry. Yeah. But if you read our original resources, and I wish I will have the time to learn our language and actually read it, it's amazing. It's mm. absolutely amazing. Because when you even tell people what is hey, they're like, oh, what is hey? Like, like, and I, I would want to ask you this question next. What is, un- what is your understanding of hey? When you hear about hey, what do you think? I don't know. Is that our God? Yes. There <laughs> you go. Like, what, what the hell is it, right? Mm. Which is common. It's very common. Like you sit there and there are people like, what is Hayy? I mean, it's like, it's not some God that sits on a throne. It's not that. It's a very, very, it's, it's a complicated, it's a yet complex very, idea, yeah. but very, very philosophical. Mm. And when you get to know it, it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Um, and that's what we're trying to spread the words. Like, look, where is, where is, where did our understanding get lost of Amandaism? Like for you, you just, you've been traveling so much. I guess part of, from my understanding, can mm. I correct me if I'm wrong, is that, your family isn't too religious. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah, but I think, honestly, like d- like your grandparents back in the 80s, back in the 70s and 60s, like everybody was so neutral. I think even baptisms weren't that common. It could be because they couldn't do mm. it like that mm. often. As Bring the mic closer want. to you. Brother. But um, yeah, so I think like the families back in the days, like in Basra or in Baghdad, like they weren't so much into religion they were very very living as just the same as he it's pretty much just chilling just living across around with the muslims because you had to also like you had to integrate you had to integrate yeah yeah which is very common right we we acquired our religious taste per se Mm -hmm. from dad Mm -hmm. so dad went through his his entire sort of i guess religious turmoil and he Mm -hmm. discovered Mm hayy and when he discovered it he passed it on to us and since then, it's always been part of the family. We, like, we grew up praying, we grew up baptizing, we grew up studying the simple, even pillars of our religion, right? Mm-hmm. And I think we've been blessed in the sense that we have the ability to, I don't know, everyone like... And I think, yeah, like I was going to say, the interesting thing is that dad's parents weren't religious at all. See? Yeah, exactly. They always told us like was they, didn't, they didn't know how to pray. Yeah. They, didn't, they didn't. And it's interesting how dad, like slowly, through his struggles and what yeah. happened in his life, like he built that, mm. which is like, that's... That's, and he's probably the only person that I know. Like yeah. he's my dad, obviously, but like this person that I know that's had that journey and it's it's like kind of completed. No, dad is like a peace, that is bro. that is peace right. If you look at that's when he's like he's just chill. Like mm-hmm. he is so at peace with everything in life. The only thing that would really trigger him trigger him was would be if if, if his sons are like struggling or they're upset mm-hmm. or there's a problem with them. Mm-hmm. That's the only time you'll see this man upset. Otherwise, he's at full understanding and full complete like full peace, mm. you know, yeah. of the fact that this is how life is. I grew up believing in this and it's led me all the way to this. And it's it's my responsibility to teach my kids that. Because I think in modern modern world, right, there is no room for religion, unfortunately. You know, a lot of a lot of modern families have lost that has has lost that unity. Mm. Um, I don't know, like, do you have any cousins that are more religious in sense or do they talk about it with you and I so I think I sort of separate my mom's side and my dad's side. My dad's side, I have a Shkenda who's my cousin, like oh, nice. my auntie's nice. yeah. um, son, and yeah, they're more they're more religious. The first time I saw someone praying was from my dad's side. I think it was. Is the Shkenda here or is he overseas? I know he's in Sweden. He's in Sweden. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, and that first time I saw someone praying the Mandian way, which I'm not even sure if she was doing it the right way or not, but it was my my dad's auntie back when I was like seven or eight years old in Sweden yeah. and that was it that was the f- first and last time I saw someone praying at home there not doing like baptism or anything so yeah and and it was very unusual for you because you're like what the hell are they doing yeah like 
Yeah, I remember like they tried to like, you know, teach me oh, like this is Darfash and you know, and there mm. was like I had one, I used to carry it. What is your understanding of the Darfash and all these simple like terms that you hear? I don't know. I'm like sorry <laughs> if I'm putting you on the spot, but this is very good for the people yeah, out no, there because you're practically the common. Yeah, you're the you're the, you're the like the bulk of you're like literally in the middle. I'm the representation. There you go, bro. Of ignorant Mandians. No, it's not ignorant. <laughs> it's like, bro, it's not your fault. Like that's just how it is, and I'm yeah. l- I'm I'm loving this because it's like this is what we need. We need more of these authentic discussions. Like, bro, what mm. the fuck? I don't know anything. Yeah, right. And it's not it's not anything. and it's not it's not your fault. It's just that's how it is. Mm. So, if you were to, if you wanted to know more, mm. like where do you, where would you want to start? Look, that's the problem, I think, that has, like, sort of prevented me of, you know, looking further into this. Because I sort of initially, at the beginning, when I first got introduced to, like, what are we as Mandeans? Or, you know, we have a Darfosh, we have a Ginza, and things like that. And this was when I was, like, eight to ten years old. Mm. I started getting, you know, interested because I'm like, oh, my God, this is something I belong to. This is my history. And we used to go to the mahals, like the baptisms. And, you know, I was always like, you know, excited, interested, hoping that I one day would undergo the same rituals and stuff. But then I got to a point where um, there was a couple of incidents of where I felt that the people, like the priests, that are supposed to represent us, um, (laughs) they are doing things, some of them, that I felt like made me feel like, you know what, I don't think I can really trust that you are a person who is only here for spirituality and not other things. Such as? Such as uh, the cash. (laughs) Which I think, like, not just in Mandian, like, even in Christianity, they are also having issues uh, with donations and where the money is going and things like that. And yes, that sort of made me feel. And another thing, you know, if you put that on the side and you think like, no, this is a good person. But now I'm like, do you actually understand the Aramaic that you are reading? That's like now from a scientific perspective where I need evidence to trust um, something. That's the only thing that I'm like now, you know, maybe we have even lost the opportunity to actually know what is going on in our religion because of that language barrier. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I'll, say, I'll tell you one thing about that incident that you faced mm. a lot of our priests actually um maybe i'll talk in defense to them because mm. I, 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 i'm in touch with a lot of them and they're quite yeah. good friends of mine mm. i think right? in iraq yes but he i don't think like in western countries you actually do have to rely solely a lot on of them are on center link, by the way. they're not a lot of them are on center link. they are so yeah what they get paid in mahar yeah and in in, in, in baptism mm. It's just, it's just an add-on sort of thank you for your, for your service, right? Yes. Now, I don't know what you've, you've, you've sort of, I guess, experienced I or witnessed. It's like, I'm okay with donations and I understand that you sort of need it to, you know, build like a, a Mendy or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And things like sending money to people overseas, totally with that. But I'm only against if people start putting up price lists for specific services. Like where they sort of, it's not really an official price list. It's more like people start being like, oh, you know, this person didn't pay me the expected um, money for like the maha, for the weddings. The weddings I've are heard very about that, expensive. Unfortunately. I have, I have. I've heard about that. Um, and yeah. it's, um, it's unfortunate that it has gotten to that point, mm. right? Um, I, can't, I don't know what to say ex- about, that, about it, except that hopefully now these things are being more, advertised and talked about as an issue yeah that um priests are a bit more aware that i think it's not just like look i'm not going to put all the blame on the priests i think it's also Mm -hmm. us as normal people who started you know we started the culture i think of donating 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 and people started thinking like if i donate more i'm a better person or something it sort of became like catholic catholics when they were like you know trying to buy out that's interesting themselves i've never thought sins. about it this way because for us like my older brother runs runs an entire committee of of international donations mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and we've always donated in the Mendy. so it's never been like it's an obligation for us to do it right mm-hmm. now when it comes to those specific examples where priests are potentially getting paid for that service mm-hmm. perhaps there should be a set fee I think that that will that will limit the discrimination and limit the bias ap- opinion because we don't want people that are on the on the on the line on the fence about the religion witnessing these things because mm. then it's a turn off. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, it's a turn off. But at the same time, it's our thank you for 
for their service, right? Because at that day, it's not just pre- it's three priests, three or four other shkendiya with them, mm. plus their time, of course, and plus their resources. Yeah. So whatever they're getting paid, they do deserve it, right? Mm. I just don't hope. I don't hope. It, I hope it doesn't become more of a like an, an a business. A business. Yeah, well, yeah. This issue, like if it's a set, if it's a set fee, mm. then people can calculate how much the sh- the, the sheikh is making and that. Like yeah, it's also not. I think it should be mm. okay based on every person's like financial ability. Like, of course, if you're a bit rich, your donations will be larger. But then they, they shouldn't be like a norm that we expect the same from everybody. Like, if I'm coming, I want to baptize my children, and I don't come from a family that is very well off, mm. there shouldn't be a feeling like, oh, you know, I don't know if I should do it because it costs. Like, I need to buy the rest, I need to whatever. Like it is expensive. Yeah, everything and I don't expensive. know, like, how can I connect finance with spirituality? Like, it just doesn't go hand in hand for me. Like, I feel like I need to really trust that this person is doing this and really sacrificing themselves. Have you met any of the priests in Australia? Uh, I've seen them, but there has never been, like, direct communication. Mm. I think that's part of the problem as well, is because mm. we, like, we... The, the men, the, like, we visit a lot of the Liverpool men, right? Mm. It's, it's the, the the youth presence isn't as strong. Unfortunately, we just don't rock up anymore that much, right? Because everyone's busy with their own thing, whatever. Yeah, that's just part of, part of life, right? What we're missing is the spark of a young, um, young priest that's more Aussie orientated, that's more relatable too. Mm. Uh, I feel like we're missing that a bit, and that's not by any means their fault, right? It's because we're still transitioning across, yeah, yeah. right? Like you can't blame them. So half the time, more than half the time, I'm communicating with those priests in Arabic. If I were to bring some of the priests here, except Sheikh Haytham potentially, I have mm. to have an entire podcast episode in Arabic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, mm, half yeah. the time I'm like, I'm like, I don't know how to ask that question because it may come across um, quite bit. like sort of rude or yeah. you know, whatever. Like mm. that's the problem that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the language barrier, right? Some of them have amazing, amazing ability to, to communicate in Arabic, right? Now they're teaching their sons to grow up and become priests, which is amazing. I'm really up for that, right? But also, um, there is no... Um, it's, it's not really a direct line of communication between us and the priest. Like, oh, like how, long, how long does it take for someone to become a priest, for example? We don't know those, like, those sort of no, things. They just no. say, oh, you've got to study, and whenever you're ready, you'll be ready. Mm. Um, that transition itself... Like, I don't know much about it. I like to stay away from these political sort of discussions, especially politically religious, like, sort of yeah. discussion. Because you don't know. You don't know. Um, like, some of the times there's been priest. If you if you want to become a priest, for example, Lazarus mm-hmm. on a Sabah Adahar. Have you ever heard about that? Mm-hmm. you got to track back a Sabah Adahar to make sure your, all your lineage is, is pure. 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 <laughs> now, what if someone has proven themselves so mundane, right? In every essence. Okay, and they're a brilliant speaker. They have all the right attributes, yet something is wrong. Yeah, this is another thing that I don't like. You know what I'm saying? How do you going to, how you going to, we can't change that. Those are established rules that have ensured the continuity of our religion. Mm. Like, I think the next, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is how important are women in our mundane community? Mm. Uh, what have you been told about it? Because that's a very important topic, right? I think women think they're, they're sort of bit sidelined in, in, our, in our religion. Some women have that uh, mm. sort of opinion. But in reality, it's actually completely the opposite. Is it? Because like the only thing I know <laughs> that we've been trying to establish like the family tree and apparently the women are not there on the family tree. Oh, so no, this is this is all <laughs> patriarchal yeah, yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. like I'm patriarchal yeah. name stuff, right? Oh, yeah. okay. But let's let's talk about the importance of women in Mandate. Like the roles. The role. The roles, yeah. What is it that you know about it? Zero. What have you been? What have you heard about it? <laughs> nothing, <laughs> actually, nothing. Not like specifically religiously, what our role is. No, not not religiously, but no. like yeah. your role in the community, like from your mother, from family, friends. How how have you grown up? Like, what have been your role models? Like, my, of course, my mom, as a hardworking woman who, like, had to independently live through so many different eras in her life. Mm. Um, so she was always my role model, and like, I think. From her perspective, it was more just like as a human being, how you should be. It wasn't really like, oh, you're a woman, this is how you should be. No, it was just as a human being. Mm. So both me and my brother were pretty much, we got the same 
the treatment, we got the same expectations from us. Good. So yeah, that was. Fair enough. So so let me ask you this then, and mm. uh, like I'm correcting if it's a bit like mm. private, but yeah. how would you, based off you know you going going up the specific way of like how you're meant to be as a human and not so much the religious aspect? Yeah. How would you see you raising your kids then? Similar to the way I raised my <laughs> <laughs> got <That's> raised. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um yeah, like I feel like. The thing is with us specifically as Iraqis, because of these things that we had in our country with like the civil war and mm, all of yeah. that stuff post-2003 and even before, I would say I lean towards instilling into your kids that first and foremost you are a human being. Anything else is a bonus. Religion should always be an addition of being a very peaceful and like... Yeah, peace-loving person. It yeah. should be an addition. It shouldn't be like as if if you're not, you know, believing and devoted, that means that you can't be a good human being. You can't be a person who has goals and aspirations and like a motivation for life. Yeah. So that's the thing I think is very important that we put into kids before everything else. And to ensure the fact that we don't want any civil wars in the future. I don't. I know it's not always gonna lead to a civil war, like being devoted and you know having faith in your religion. But I think it puts a lot of you know walls and boundaries yeah. between humans. There's tensions, yeah, definitely. Like that's that's we, that's. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna mention that at one point. Is that like there are um, there are kind of conversations happening in in our in our communities and our in our religion where yeah. there's disagreements. Mm. And that's like that's common in, in any religion. Like you know, uh, we have our brothers, the Muslim brothers, our the mm. Syrian brothers. Like it's mm. it's common, but because we're such a small minority, that's gonna have a big implication. What do you mm. reckon? Like uh, those civil kind of like in within yeah, us, in, in our, within yeah, us. Without, yeah, and, yeah, I and know, and, and that's what like upsets me even more because I'm like, we are only uh, one, two, three, four, five people, yeah, exactly. and if we're gonna have further divisions, like people are dividing, or oh, what? whatever tribe are you from what family are you from are you from iraq or are you from iran all these things <laughs> yeah. like no no forget about all these things i think it's becoming better now though especially with the iraq iran are you sure i feel yeah, like it's going that, the other way no, no, no the iraq iran better. i think it's becoming much better but because, like yeah. half of our mates yeah. like the boys that i had on to each yeah. other daniel and anwar yeah anwar is iraqi he's married mm. to an iranian mm. daniel is iranian he's married to iraqi mm. so the yeah. mixture is becoming more like we're chill man like there's no Should harm be, yeah. and it was only our gener our parents' generation that had this problem. And the reason being is because of the war. Okay, yeah. Other than that, mm. there's no problem, man. Mm. We were literally just living across the river from each other. Yeah. Look, may maybe it's different than like other countries, but in our country like here, mm. it's that's not it's not an issue. It's not. It's because yeah. you have such freedom of speech and in general mm. you're protected as equals that they don't have to have those clashes anymore. Right? Like Iraqi Iranian priests are getting along the youth, half of the youth, mm. the Mandan Youth Australia, which we've worked with, and I love the boys there, mm. half of them are Persian. Mm. The OG group that I worked with back in 2014, 90% yeah. of them were Persian, right? And the minority were Iraqi, okay? Now it's sort of like, it's probably like 50-50. But man, mm. they're such good c contacts to have. They're amazing. Mm. And the reason being is because a lot of them came in the 80s, mm. right? They were well established. Well established. So, like, we're going to have one of our very, very good friend of ours, Michael, very on soon as well. Mm. He's been here since the 80s. Mm. The guy is amazing. He's an accountant for the association. Yet he runs his own businesses. He's, he's done so much for the community and in Australia in general. And it's those sort of people that you link up with day in day out. Like, Daniel is one of my closest mates, man. We grew up mm. together here, mm. right? So, there's no longer this clash. There's no longer this tension, right? And the reason being is because we have an ability to discuss a lot of problems that we didn't used to have we didn't we couldn't discuss back in back, back in, the, in the past yeah. like mm -hmm. this problem of or oh, the priests are getting paid for example mm -hmm. we never ha our parents could not have had an open dialogue about this shit no one can talk about yeah, it course, it's like bro what do you believe in i'm mundane what does that mean Man, shut the fuck up like it's just <laughs> like just just like this is how it is to shut up right go pray what does that mean shut up go pray yeah. there was no critical thinking there was no discussion about what well, you said before like even faith-wise, I want to know mm. why they're doing this, right? So now I'll go back to my original question, right? Mm. The importance of womanhood in Mendaism, right? Mm. That's a very core, like, core concept that has not been properly discussed, mm. right? And the reason being is, 
there just hasn't been an, an, an opportunity for it, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of times it gets discussed in Arabic in the Mendy, where it's more uh, related to the older generation, and then by the time they get it through to their kids, the kids are like, I'm not interested in this, no, I'm fucking, it's not even in English, someone tell me this stuff in English, right? Mm-hmm. And this is a very good opportunity for me to, to have this discussion with you about it, right? Do you know, for, for example, right, that in order for a priest to level up, he has to marry a Mendayan woman? Yeah, I've heard okay. that. Right, that's part of it, right? Mm. And the fact that we get our names from the woman, from the mothers, mm. is very yeah, important because it. that's how we keep the pure lineage. It's not through the man, it's with the woman. Mm. Okay, yeah. So the woman represents the circle of life in our, in our community. It's not the other way around. The man is there just as a provider, right? But for the woman, she represents the circle of life through pregnancy, through delivery through raising the children through giving them the milwasha which they have to adhere to in order for them to be baptized and how that's how the root of the priesthood actually climbs up the ladder mm-hmm. so it's very important that we know that that we are aware of the, the significance of of of, um, the woman. Uh, of the women now at one point cholera took over in iraq and iran i'm not too sure about that story this is a very very classic story most of most of the priests actually all of them got wiped out they got sick or they died. Cholera, you just get fucking diarrhea. Is that any, was that Iran or Iraq? Uh, somewhere, uh, Iraq yeah. or Iran. I think it was Iran maybe. So they got wiped out. They made a woman a priest. And it's either Dara. Huh? Yeah. There, are, there were, ex- there were, ex- there were exa- like exceptions. Mm-hmm. And that's how they continued the lineage, right? So at one point, we were saved by a woman, woman, uh, a woman that became a priest. There's, there's a lot of stories. Of, uh, that's not... And it, there are exceptions, but there's multiple exceptions. Like yeah, there are yeah. other stories when I used to go to Mandane school when I was like eight years old. They used to they were, they taught us like stories of like those those women here and there throughout history that have literally continued that lineage mm-hmm. through saving or through this that I swear yeah. like it's 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 interesting. It's interesting because yeah. we value the woman not because she's just a woman, but because again she represents life, right? The the embryo the um, the womb itself is a very very highly holy place in the mundane. It represents a lot. It represents a lot, especially if you look at it from a, a, a religious point of view, a lot of the times um, the embryo represents the essence of life. Okay? And sorry, not the embryo, the uterus represents the essence of life. And for us, woman, especially womanhood itself and motherhood is highly regarded as the most sacred thing in our religion. It's the most sacred. Nothing, nothing beats that, right? Um, so... I think there's been a bit of a mislink between why, like the priests and stuff, and and, and like we don't want to get into it because it is a highly like controversial it's, topic, right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I would always love to remind our audience and just even the females that how important you are in our religion. It's a very significant. You have a sig- you play a very significant role in it. Um, we're such a small community that we have to empower the woman and the man um, in their roles in, in, in raising kids. And ensuring that the right message is passed across, um, and 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 even making sure that you truly identify as a as a mundane, not just by name but by practice as well, right? Um, like just simple as baptism. Like, what do you know about baptism, for example? That's a very good question. Like, you've never been baptized, which is great for this question. Mm-hmm. But what is your understanding of baptism? I think it's some sort of like. Um, so we always know that you know the flowing river is. The rejuvenating sort of yep. force, yep, of um, life, yep. yeah. So that's pretty much the only thing that I can connect baptism to. Yeah, it's it's practically that. It's mm. pretty much it's a renewal of faith mm. with Hayi mm. through through water because for us the element of water is the most. It's it's pretty much the the, the most sacred thing, mm. apart from like uh, birth and and pregnancy and womanhood. It's actually up there because when we relate to life, we relate to like flowing water as the most important um, element in the universe. Um, so we've identified this as the most. That's that's why our religion isn't more. It's a physical. It's it's way more spiritual in sense mm. because when you look at those core elements like water, like when we are as a human, we're made of seventy percent of water, man. Like even the blood when you sample it. Serum takes around 70% of that, 80% of that. And most of it is just H2O, right? Um, we've identified this as an element three, 4,000 years ago. That this is a very significant part uh, that has ensured the survival of all species on Earth, right? And the fact that we can 
identify those simple elements in a religion that's so old, right? Mm. Is that's cool. You know, that's cool. Extra, I heard you, you saying know. mentioning that in like a couple of episodes. Yeah, it's ago. it's and extraordinary. It cool it's so it's it's so amazing, yeah. right? Like, and part of it is that the baptism itself mm. represents uh, a way of reconnecting your faith yeah. with Hagi because you go through the process of being submerged in water, freezing your ass off, and you're getting mm. out then you have having the ability to calm down and meditate through the process. And the priest is there as a representing a presentation of a melki. Mm. And what he's doing is, all he's doing is, is carrying in your message and your renewal of faith to the upper worlds. And he represents a melki because he's actually got his head covered, his face covered. Mm. And as they transition through, as you, if you watch him, he'll go mm. from a melki bank to back to a human. By the end, by the time he unwraps the, uh, the face covering, he's back to a human. And that's what it is. It's renewing your faith, but unfortunately, a lot of times we just sit down in our baptism and just talk shit. No one, fa- no, no one focuses. That's why I have, I've yeah. never heard of any of these things, even though I've been to so many baptisms. I've never, I never knew why he would put it. No, it's because he's face. not. A, he doesn't represent a human. He's a priest in our religion. Isn't just a person. Mm. He's a carrier. He's a messenger of he, 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 he's his role is to ensure the survival of the mundane community by mm. carrying their message across to he. Now, Hei itself is a different. It's, it's an amazing. It's an amazing concept. We can sit there and talk to talk about it for hours. But for example, that's that's baptism. Like mm-hmm. I love the fact that you know the simple thing about itself. It's it's a rejuvenation of like a rejuvenation of um, of your faith. Mm-hmm. But the process itself, it's the circle of life. Like you get up, you get in the water, you cleanse your, you cleanse yourself, mm-hmm. then you meditate, and then you are rebirthed, and you have a. You, by the time you finish your baptism, you've actually given yourself. A promise, and that promise is delivered by the priest to hey you that you want to start a new life. So every time you break this promise, you not look like a smile. So good luck. Which is why some people go every week. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. But it's it's an amazing thing. Like I would. That's why it's intru- it's very like for me. I we, we we pushed for having more girls on the podcast mm. because yeah. this is part of it, right? Of it's um, it's 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 knowing where we stand and yeah. where are the gaps, right? And it's and it's uh, no one's fault why someone is uh, someone's missing their information. It's just that's how you grow up. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is this is that that it should be it should be like that. We should have open discussions about these sort of things. We should be able to identify uh, any sort of problems. Now, I want you to tell me what sort of issues you've encountered in, in the community that you sort of apart from the priesthood and stuff that mm-hmm. sort of has turned you off per se. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, feel free to share whatever you want to share, of course. I don't know. Like, I think for me, um, I always compare the community in Sweden versus the, compu- the community in Australia. Mm. And there are a little bit of differences, I think. I don't know if it has to do with how many years people have like left Iraq for or it has to do with just like the environment being different. So for us, like younger generations, the ones in Sweden – are slightly different from the ones here in Australia. Like, I think the way that you just carry on your life, lifestyle. In Sweden? Yeah. It's a bit different. Is like it disconnected from a culture? It is a bit more disconnected. I've heard about the, like, the European <laughs> mandates. They're like, they're wild, bro. They are wild. <laughs> <laughs> My cousins, there, half the time, they're like, one of them is a DJ, the other one's like yeah. a salesman. And What's I'm like, bro, you guys... I have, I have a girl cousin who's a DJ in Sweden. Bro, right, what is this shit? <laughs> <laughs> one left and went to Dubai. Just... <laughs> but yeah, one of them is like, moving. It's like, I'm out. I'm just going to move to Dubai now. I'm <laughs> like... Wow, like yeah, what is this? I, I think they're more chill. Um, I don't think they're disconnected from their families as much. No, I think he. We also have a little bit of issues with children not really liking to be part of the families that mm. much, especially when they reach like this age. I don't know how this boy is, but <laughs> but yeah, like uh, there is a little bit of problems. But uh, I think it has to do with like just you know they integrate into the community more like into the society more in sweden like okay. into the swedish society which obviously um gives them a lot of different things than here do you think we're losing a lot of members we're over by, there yeah by yes. into, like religious and yes and yes we are having that but i can't you can't blame them because again we scattered we don't see each other that often so what are the odds that you'll actually find someone and love them and marry them it's not that high unless yeah. you specifically go looking or your parents are looking for you or whatever which is not really you know a thing anymore yeah 
So it's you can't blame them for doing that. Um, I don't think it has to do with the fact that they don't want to be part of, you know, or like represent Mandaism. It, it's just the life, like that's how it's happening. So it's just it's um, like their limits. It's just you're just limited. You're limited by choice, and I think yeah. that's why I think one of the biggest communities in of Mandaism is in Australia now. So we're seeing more growth in couples, mm. even though it's still very hard. Don't get me mm. wrong. Dating is yeah, 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 yeah. It's hard. Yeah. Um, but then if you were to look, do you still um, do you still sort of support the traditional roles that, that we have as partners? Like when you say traditional, what exactly are you referring like to? Like we're talking about okay, that's a very interesting one. Because yeah. we're talking about tradition and we're talking about okay, the man is the leader of the household. Mm. I think there's it's with this common modern sort of I guess cultural rev- revolution. A lot of women are becoming much, much more masculine in nature, much more boss-like lady per se, and yeah. that makes it even far, far harder for a smaller community mm. to date and find the right person. Mm. You no, know, have you come across your own? Like, have you come across experiences like that? And where do you stand on that? Because that's a very interesting question. Mm. Like, feminism has grown so much, for example, in our community. You know, that we, we, we actively have pe- members that always have something to say against the, the patriarchy and the way the religion is. And Etc. Mm. I don't know if you're comfortable to talk about this sort of stuff, but this is mm. what we stand at, at the moment. Unfortunately, it's mm. it's it's an issue in every religion. Mm. Where do you stand on that? I support that today, as women, it's not you can't really follow the traditional values anymore mm. because you have the thing with us becoming, you know, we're following the same path that the men are following. You know, you're getting educated, you're go- stepping into the professional You world. have all these freedoms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, the same freedoms. It's not just about freedoms, it's also about obligations. Like, there's so much responsibility that today we have to deal with mm. just as much as the men. So how can you, like, not, you know, give your opinion about things in life if you are already, like, at the same level? So... Like simple things like in the house, like you want to share everything. That's mm. how it should be. Whether people are bossy or whatever, that's up to their personality, like how they are as a person. I don't mm. think it has to do with feminism as much as it has to do with, you know, you as a person and what you feel like. Mm. But I think like definitely sharing at the like always you have to do that. Like sharing your opinions, sharing your communication decisions, is a big part. Yeah. things like that. Like you can't, you know, just like, oh, you know, well, I'm the leader. I'm not gonna ask my partner what they are thinking. No, le- leaders has like as a leader, I think as a man mm. with a, with a, with, who is a true leader, right? Mm. When he gets handed this, it's a massive responsibility. Mm. So you're not you're not leading blindly, because if you're leading blindly, you're not a good leader. Yeah. Right? You always have to revert back to your teammates, which is your wife, your kids, your extended family. Um, I think we've we've grown up in a very uh, patriarchal sort of home, right? Yeah. Where dad has the responsibility and he just passed it on to us that way, right? Mm. So mum understood that very well and she raised us that way, right? So he, so we were raised with, you have a responsibility to, b- to be a man. You have mm. a responsibility to provide I mean, very well and support and, and support your woman, of course, but at the same time, everything at the end falls on you. You have mm. to make sure that you meet your end of the bargain, which means you have to be the best version of yourself as a man. But it's pu- it puts a lot of pressure on you, doesn't I th- it? I think that's just that's like part of being a man. To be my honest. brother, that's how men are. My younger brother, he is coming up with this idea that I think a lot of young okay, men are coming up with. What's happening? <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, good. All right, let's keep going. So. Um, yeah, what was the question? Yeah, I, I we're lost talking track. about the traditional uh, roles of women and men in the household. Mm. So I was saying that there is this new fashion uh, of people wanting to go back to the cave days. <laughs> My brother is like talking about how like, oh, you know, we are men. We have to take care of the family and like provide for our woman and, you know, make sure that we can buy a house at a young age and all these things. And I'm just like... Oh, and he doesn't want his wife to work. And I'm like, excuse me. Um, mm. Listen, at the <laughs> today's uh, finances and economy crisis, I don't think it's possible mm. for you to unless take on the like whole yeah, responsibility. Uh, I mean, I'd be happy to sit not. at home and not having to freaking care about how much I've got in my bank account and all the bills and things like that. Mm. But it's very hard. And also, you see all these men here in Australia that are like, I don't know, having issues and crisis at the age of 45 because they're feeling so cornered because of finances yeah. that they actually commit suicide. Like, I heard about a couple of incidences and I'm like, 
why should we put that much responsibility on one person? If you can live together and share all these things, you know, yeah. mutually, and then that shouldn't be an issue. It should be just a good thing that you are having someone to support you, whether it's emotionally or financially. Look, the problem is, is that I, mean, I think it, it depends on the men. Mm. It really does depend on the men. I've had my own experiences in that, and I would say that I would always – Take on the burden itself. I don't care. That's just how mm-hmm. it is. And the reason being is because that's for us men. It's different. Like mm-hmm. you're not competing against anyone else. You're just competing against yourself, yeah. right? And being a top quality, high quality man means you have to be able to think about that time when your woman will be will be taking time off to have kids and raising the kids. You need to have a strong income. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, eighty percent of the men out there are invisible. That's the reality of it. That's mm. why we had the stabbing in Bondi. Mm. That's part of it. I want this, that part of it. Like I was talking to the boys the other day about it, and I was like, "Look, if we were to, um, if we were to look at the core issue around that, he stabbed six women. Mm. Why is that? I think he must have felt rejected at some point in his life. That's that part made of him it. That's feel part that of it, right? Hate. But let's let's also think about it from a different perspective. If that man hasn't been the best version of himself. If he's getting rejected, doesn't have mm. the right, the right support growing up, the right mentorship, especially having a strong father figure at home. Yeah. Right. Yep. And you get told, "Hey, be strong, like man up." No one cares about your fucking feelings. That's what happens. Mm. That's what happens with men with their mental health. You either kill yourself or you go on a, ra- you'll go on a, and pretty much on a rage. Mm. Right. That's the problem. Is that yeah. when men we've been taught, which is wrong. I don't, I don't believe in that. I feel mm. like that man should be able to sit together and talk about these sort of things, yeah. especially when, like me, Rewan, and Safe, my older brother, we always sit down mm. and talk about these things mm. all the time. And the, the reason is because it's fucking stressful being a man. Yeah. There's so much. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, when in the midst of, you know, kick, you know, we kickstarted a podcast where we don't know where this is going to go, right? But we're interested in it. We know it's not going to make us any financial profit mm. for a while. If it does, great. If it doesn't, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I have a bigger vision, like a vision of it, right? Mm. I've got to focus on my career. I've got to make sure I'm making more money. Um, I have to invest wisely so I can make sure by the time I do decide to get married, I have the right woman. I have enough for her that I, she can retire and I can retire if she chooses not to work. Mm. Now you've said something very interesting, which was, mm. I wish I could just sit at home mm. and not worry about it. Because ideally, a stressed woman isn't a healthy woman. And right, of course, and, yeah. And like, even a stressed man is not a healthy man, no. right? But a stress on man usually ends up making us do more and more with our life. It pushes us, mm. okay. But for a woman, I think when she is stressed, it's not good on her mental health in general because it really changes her as a woman. Mm. It makes her more, you know, lead into anxiety, depression, all these sort of things. And the reason being is because, like, it's tough these days out there. It is tough because a lot of the women are being taught that you have to. You have the right, same right opportunities. I don't know. Like, that's how I look at it. You have the same opportunities as a man. Yeah, you should be just as good. You should be just as good or even yeah. better. That's fucked up. <laughs> that is really terrible way to think about it. And the reason being is because the workforce is shit. Mm. It's, not, it's not a half the time. It's not a very pleasant environment, especially for a woman to be in. Like a PhD in autoimmunity, that's already a huge stress factor for a woman, right? Mm. I'm not saying it's not a stress for a fact man. It's probably the fucking same shit. It's not much yeah. of a difference, right? Mm. But what I always say is, is that a, a man, like we, we sort of pass that message that a man should always be leading by example. And you should always push to be the best version of yourself. That when the woman comes, she respects that, right? And she sees it and you're a teammate. Mm. You're a team. You yeah. work out of it and you complement each other. You shouldn't be competing. You shouldn't be telling you, hey, I earn just as much as you and mm. therefore... You should be doing that. No, it shouldn't. It should, it should be very complementary, right? And I feel like mm. we're losing this. And we can't go back to the stern age, unfortunately. We can't go back to this traditional values. Mm. But we have to take what has worked right in the past mm. and move on to the future with. Because mm. this, this country gives our people a lot of freedom mm. and a lot of, um, a lot of options, right? Which I've seen a lot of women go down the pathway of feminism, of boss ladies, and I don't need a man, I don't need a man. And then they hit... They hit an age where they're like, actually, I do need a man. But, <laughs> but by that time, it's like, you know, like you are the oh, late sorry, 20s. They're all gone. <laughs> they're all gone because you rejected half of them back then because you thought you were better than most of them. And that's the problem right now is that man, I've been told, bro, no, don't get, get your heart broken. Go work hard on yourself. 
don't focus on women. And the woman is like, I don't need a man. I can just make money. Why should I get married? That's the problem. And it's the same problem in every culture. So I don't know. That's that's my opinion on That's my a bit of, bit of take on that is that unfortunately we've lost those those pure roles, right? Those those roles that what a woman stands for and what a man stands for is because you've been being fed all this shit into into the ma- into the man's life that it's all right you can be we you can be that but women aren't attracted to that I'm sorry they're not att- I don't know what do you think but that's how I look at it women are not attracted to weak men they're not attracted to men that don't know how to lead per se and don't aren't the best versions of themselves because at one point the woman will lose interest in that man so. I think, yes, like partially you're right. Uh, we're still looking for the traditional one where he is a bit of a leader, he's a bit of a protector. Yeah. That you can sort of, you know, rely on them. Mm. But I th- don't think you should, like, as a woman, expect too much. And, like, you know, especially the thing with the finances, I think it's just too much to expect from your future husband to be the sole provider for the family. Mm. Um, that's the main thing. Other than that, I think, okay, you can, but... Also, like, things like, you know, in the household, um, do you wash dishes? Do you not wash dishes? Do you clean? Do you not clean? These things, I think, definitely should be shared. And not should be the old way where it's just the woman taking no. care of the whole house. I've, 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 my dad does it. My brother does it. Yeah, it's not, it's exactly. So you got to help around. You've if got you kids, have you got that family. as a complimentary, then 100% with you. But these, well. these are the small factors. Like, these yeah. are the small things that once mm. you live with that person, mm. we don't have the luxury of living with our partners, right, mm. until marriage. Mm. So a lot of times you're, you miss a lot of the red flags, and I think that's part yeah. of the problem as well, is that you don't identify the red flags early. Or you look at them and you're like, oh, I can live with that person. Mm. Oh, shit, you don't. Mm-hmm. You end up either struggling, or unfortunately ends up in divorce a lot of times because you haven't staged it mm. too much, right? Yeah. And I think that's a very good message for the youngsters out there is that take your time. Take your time to qualifying really each other yeah. and knowing what they are because mm. you're not just marrying that person, you're marrying an entire family, right? And if That's the families true. are so different, mm. uh, then you're likely to, to have a lot of clashes and you're going to fall in the middle of it, yes. right? So I think if the families, at least the family's qualities are very similar mm. and they're traditionally very similar, then you're likely to... Um, Succeed. Yes. <laughs> it will be good Definitely. because... because you're still keeping the grandparents around. They're going to love around. They're going to yeah. come and support you while raising the kids. It's a very healthy environment to be in. Mm. But I, I don't know. I, I, I just see that it's um, unfortunately it's 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 a problem in the modern dating world that other women are coming out saying I don't need a man or there's what men are offering these days isn't good enough. You know, in in return as well good at enough, the time. Only you mean financially? Everything. You know, everything. Because at the end of the day, a man like needs to have a set of criteria before he approaches a woman, mm. right? I don't know like how you th- what your take is on it, and I would mm. like to hear your take on it. Mm. Is that when men, as they grow up, they mm. accumulate a lot of different traits and a different, uh, I guess, a status with age, right? Where a woman is born with value, right? And her value comes with her beauty, her femininity, all these sort of things. And I think um, modern women at times even the younger ones but like the ones that are 21 22 23 whether they, they perhaps at the they, they're at the peak of their beauty etc all these sort of things um they're likely to reject all these good men out there that are having all these traits because they're still not good enough for them and this is a modern problem that we're facing mm. um a man takes time to develop his tricks and he's sorry not his tricks his trades mm. and his his skills and not, some of them don't even hit those i guess until mid thirty. Thank you. Mid thirties, right? Yeah. So I know. You know, I've been thinking about it actually. Um, before I didn't think it was that difficult, but now I'm like, oh my god! Like, there is there is a certain protocol that is like being followed. Like, as a young woman, we know always that oh, women mature faster than men. Blah blah blah. Uh, that's we know that already. That's a, that's, that's that's very important. Yeah, and then. You like at the age of twenty five as a woman, and you're looking around you, boys that are twenty five, they're not like emotionally as mature as you are yet, and so you end up looking at like people who like thirty, thirty five, like oh my gosh, I don't want to marry someone who's like five, ten years older than me. You would rather be with someone who's at the same age, but at the same time, they might not have reached the same stage in life that you are at. Mm-hmm. And I know what you're saying, like. You see a lot of people um, that 
you like, oh, no, they're not good enough for me. It's not good enough or not good enough, but I think there are a couple of things. Like for me, for example, personally, I would look at firstly, like, how well educated are you? Okay, you can also look past that and, okay, you don't have to be a professor because now I'm doing a PhD. You have to be above me. I don't expect that. But at least the same level? doesn't necessarily have to. Mm. I've also given up on that one because I'm like, okay, you know what? Sometimes people are educated, but the brains for the normal life <laughs> is not that great. <laughs> so maybe let's just forget about education and just as long as you're stable financially in your life, it doesn't have to be that, oh, you've got an amazing business, you're earning that yeah. much money. No, it's just a normal everyday job that is like bringing you an income that has room for growth and improvement because I'm also like still growing and still improving. So I totally, you know, understand that you are also need, in need of growing and improving. Mm -hmm. But that's one thing. And then you have the other thing with like families being compatible because yeah, that's, that's a a very one, important. A and there comes the thing with me coming from a family that I'm not sure how common in Mandeans we have these families that are very neutral, religiously. They're very common. I don't think in Australia they're very common. I feel like in Sweden, yes, more. Mm -hmm. But here I feel like there's a lot of people that are, you know, putting a lot of weight on religion, which I can't really assimilate with and, like, relate to. So I'm like, uh, that's sort of bringing me in a little bit of, like, trouble because... I don't know if I can find all of these traits in that person that can I can sort of see as a future partner. And now I'm not sure how much I can compromise on these things. Like, I should mean, look, I compromise? You said, you said I've given up on... Okay, we'll, we'll talk about the first yeah. thing, which is the age. Yeah. It's a very good, it's mm. a good point. Mm. Women have to mature younger, mm. at, a, at a younger age. Just evolutionary, yeah. that's just how it is. They have yeah. to. They, they need to be much more switched on, at mm. least. They tend to... The From the age of three, 15, four I feel like I was already ready. Yeah, it's like <laughs> three, four years. Three, four years, right? Um, yeah. You have to understand three, four years into the, uh, like, there's, there's, a, there's a gap of three to four years between man and woman. Mm. And that's a healthy evolutionary gap because a woman have to be a, have to be aware of what sort of partner she has to select that can provide for her when she has kids, that can provide for the kids. So the reason why when you looked at someone who are yours age, because at 25, I wasn't thinking that way. Yeah, I was like just clubbing, Mm -hmm. party and just exams that's all i had i'm mm -hmm. still stuck in gold coast doing medicine so i wasn't really at that point right mm -hmm. now i look at it, i'm like fair enough no 24 of you i don't think i don't think being of a similar or same age is healthy for the for the for the partners mm -hmm. i think there should be a gap mm -hmm. i think at least two to three even four year gap between the male and the female is a healthy gap mm -hmm. because practically the mentality is probably gonna be at the same thank you yeah. Even even a bit more better mm. when in terms of the wisdom that you bring to the table, right? Mm. Um, and I can see that. And then the other thing that you said was um, like certain things that you've just given up on, like being mm. on the same level. Is that because is it you had a bigger bigger list of things that you're expecting to find, and then as you sort of progress through them, and you're like, ah, uh, sort it's of, just not yeah. really, yeah. No, and also I think it's just um, like learning from experiences and seeing how people actually behave. I just thought that, you know what, maybe education is not really uh, the most important thing because it's not going to guarantee that on a personal level the person You're is... You're going to succeed with that Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Like, it doesn't necessarily... Like, I've, you see people educated, but you're like, Ugh, you're so dry or whatever. Or <laughs> True. Or, like, they're just... I don't know, like... I don't know. They're just not what you would expect them to be just because they're educated. It's not always the, um, the most educated that are the most... Mm. On point and all street on. smart or all these things you know it's um um it's a very it's a very tough gig for a man to to, to bring all these things to the to the table mm. and i think that's part of the message that that we want to pass on is that you no know, no being a man is not easy because in order for you to find the right woman um you have to bring so much to the table you have to be fit you have to have a good career you have to bring good money to the table you have to have different attributes like socially smart mm. street smart these things take a lot of time and for the men that don't have the good guidance in their life, you're not going to fucking get that at yeah, all. Yeah, exactly. You're just going to be a loser. And unfortunately, a loser ends up someone other without a wife or ends up stabbing six people in Bondi because mm. that's, that's just how it is. I think that's what we're missing. we're missing. We're missing this educational awareness for men. Hey, guys, wake the fuck up. 
right? It's not about finding the right partner, but it's being the best version of yourself. Yeah, and I always go back to yeah, that. Yeah, being mm. the best version of yourself, honestly. Like, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that, you know, you have to be a doctor or whatever. Like, just try, always try your best. And don't just linger around for five, six because years. Because it's unattractive. Between the age of 18 and 25, not accomplishing anything, nothing. Like, you're not going to the gym. You're not working on your education. You're not working on getting a good career somehow. So at the age of 30, what we have? Nothing. And usually, like, the way I look at it is women tend to, tend to be peak mm. around the 23 to 25 year mark. Mm, already, yeah. Yeah, they tend to, that's, that's the most, like, f- that's, that's where, tr- like, traditionally, mm. we'll say that's where women used to get married. Even younger, but now it's sort of shifting towards it. Cause, but that's, mm. there, that's where they reach the peak beauty, all these sort of stuff, right? Yep. Men doesn't, don't peak until 30, mm. even 35. Because um, the reason being is because, again, you just said it, it takes a while for men to cum- accumulate all these sort of traits. And unfortunately, a lot of men don't understand that. They get to 30 and I meet so many men who are just miserable. Mm. Miserable. I got rejected or my woman who I've been married to left me. Well, why, man? She fell out of love with me. What the fuck? Does, what, do you, you know what that means? It means, it means you've, you've, you've changed the way you are as a person so much that the original man that she fell in love with is no longer there, right? Mm. And that's one of it. Mm. The second thing is is that or they get to 30 to 32 and they can't find themselves a partner, right? Mm. And why is that as well? Is Because, again, you haven't done shit in your life, man. Why should a woman allow you that opportunity, right? Mm. Now, I do, I do question, I do have something else, which is do you think it's more aware for a high-value woman or to, for a high-value man to exist out there? Because it's very hard for a man to be be very, very, like, on top of his game, which is very hard these days, right? Mm. But for you personally, you've come across your own personal experiences, etc. Do you think women should be as picky as they are with men? Mm. Not, I don't know, like, there's different women, obviously. Some people... What about your girlfriends? Like, what do they say? No, for my ones, I think they're pretty reasonable. (laughs) They're just looking for compatibility, in personality yeah. and like values cool. and a decent job. That's it. Pays the bills. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Like, as I was telling you, anything other than that and exceeding that, especially in terms of financially, I'm totally against it because you're just putting too much pressure on people. Too much pressure. Fair enough. So you'd rather grow together. Person. Yeah, so if you've worked on yourself as a person, uh, that's already, you know, a white flag. <laughs> That this person actually, you know, whatever they can do, they try to better themselves. Fair, fair. What is your what are the red flags for men? Red flags. It's to not be working on yourself. Mm-hmm. Just l- like staying loser, stagnant. You don't have ambitions. Mm. You don't have goals. Just a loser, pretty much. No, let's not be that mean. I I, I, <laughs> like, I just say it up there, man. I don't care. To let's be honest. not be that mean. But do you just. D- yeah, yeah, you continue. Yeah. No, no, keep going. I was going to say, do you think there's a limit on, like, this man has reached this age, so it's too late now? Like, yeah, he's going to be I a loser so. for his life? I think the uh, limit is 28. That's wow. it. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> 28. After that? And you have not? Done. That's it. Sorry, I'm yeah. very sorry. You're going to be very late. Honestly, like, life is so short. You don't have that much time to just, like, play around. <laughs> yeah. We say that all the time, man. And he's, like, freaking out. Like, but don't say that. Don't okay, say that. Like, I was freaking out. But no, you're not freaking out. Yeah, I don't like, like, I'm like, bro, every time I'm with you, like, life is short, short. Life is short. I'm no, like, bro, you can't say it to a 16 year old. I think it's because at, after 25, you're like, shit, I'm running. Yeah. <laughs> I'm running. Do you reckon a lot of women, like, freak out after the age of 25? What they freak mean? out after 25. You're like, shit, I'm not going to find the right partner. Oh, yes. I'm not. I think so. Yeah, and me, I don't know what's going on with this biological clock thingy. It's yeah. not even true. Like my mom gave birth to my brother at the age of 38. It's totally fine, guys. Did you have any nah, Did you have any complications though? No, no. No diabetes, no blood pressure? No, no, no. no. Yeah, 38 Actually, isn't that better than my pregnancy. I was the first kid and she had more issues with me gaining so much weight. With my brother, she was... Weight is fine, but I'll tell you what so happened with Rewan. Mom had him at 40. Mm. She came out with diabetes, she came out with blood pressure, and she still got those problems. Oh. So high risk pregnancies do exist after the age of thirty five. Yeah. So biological clock. Maybe after forty. Maybe after forty. No, I think after thirty five. I that's think you're a high risk. The high risk pregnancy is after thirty five. In medicine, but I yeah. think from the personal experience that I experienced, mm. my mom, I would say after yeah. forty is the problem. But it depends. Depends on the. Yeah. 
woman on bro. the body yeah yeah we're, we're talking like we're talking what's general and what's what's out there right it's mm. high risk pregnancy after 35 it's yeah. it's it's we treat it if i come across anyone in the clinic mm. it's high risk pregnancy clinic straight away because your risk of having miscarriages, having all bleeds, the chromosomal problems. Yeah, yes, because your eggs are older, pretty much. Mm. All these things, right? All these things are very important. Mm. That's why everything is being shifted these days. Every woman are choosing to get married later, mm. um, and then they get married. They, they, they want to have kids quite quickly, and then they tend to have them late twenties, mm. early thirties. Look, it's not a bad thing. It's still very generally healthy, right? But don't take it. Take, take, don't take too long. Like, don't push it above the age of 35 to 38. Just, just. It's not really a button you can press. You can't. Like those beautiful No, it's not, of course. <laughs> but it's not that yeah, easy true. to say. But I always say, like, yeah. it's. Um, Ideally, if you can, and if you're at, the, like, you already have your partner and stuff like yeah. that, you should think about I'm talking about the ones that are married. Like, moving to the next step. one. Don't take too long in yeah. that state. Because if you're married, you've got the partner and. Mm. And you feel like you're okay. You're good. That's it. Have them. Don't lack too much. Mm. Don't don't prioritize your career. Don't because all these things yeah, will come. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a lot of women, are like no, no, I'm not gonna have a baby until yeah. I, I'm finished my career. All right, then you're tw- thirty now. Yeah, How no, many kids are you gonna have? Are you gonna be? Are you still gonna be raising them? They're gonna be ten or even eleven, twelve when you're 42, 43, mm. right? It's, it's, you're an old parent. Yeah. Can you relate to your kids at that age? Mm. I don't know. Like, and not just that, you're not gonna have much time with them. Like when they yeah. grow old and like reaching the age of 20 and above that's the fun times with your kids yeah, that's exactly. when you become friends thank you it's so it's if you miss out on that uh, like safe is very close to mom and dad right mm. i'm close too but i feel like rewind you've grown up a bit with mom and dad are already old yeah, uh, you're the I'm you're gonna, the you're the good example yeah, you're the I, prime I, example of that like i've reflected on that within the last yeah. like i'm turning 17 in like yeah. three weeks so i can you have time to reflect on it and you're like mm. i'm i'm okay with it. i have two amazing brothers mm. so um, you yeah, have the yeah. young aspect in the family sort of thing. Yeah, like, yeah. but like, I'm happy with. Look, obviously, in my head, I'm like, I wish I can experience what they experienced with the mom and dad. Parents, yeah. But I mean, look, mom and dad are healthy. They're mm. chilling. They're fine. So I'm. I, I guess I'll be okay. Yeah. But again, like, it's it's something to consider. Be like, I'm gonna. I'm most likely gonna miss out on like a fundamental thing mm. when I'm in my twenties. Yeah. But it is what it is. I guess I don't know. It's yes. uh, it's a very ri- it's a very um, tricky topic because again people are delaying the idea of marriage and again fifty percent of marriages are ending in divorce these days. Mm. Uh, I don't know what's going on. People are giving up too easily. They they not they're not qualifying each other properly. They're not picking yeah. each other for the right. They're avoiding red flags, as you said before. And you s- you s- yourself is like they're not working on themselves. Mm. But that's a lot of women, men out there. It's a lot of men out there. Uh, who just aren't working on themselves and are not improving, and they're expecting to get married, they're expecting to find a wife. Why? Why would someone give you a chance? I'm yeah. sorry, like that. That's and a father at least when he meets the man, first thing he'll think about is like, what the fuck does he do for his job? Can he mm. provide? Because mm. that's what they think about. That's what I would think about when I have my kids. If I have girls and they come for me, and I'll first thing, what does he do for work? Mm. Cool. That gives me a good idea about his his level of of um, his level of hard work, yeah. resilience, discipline. That sort of gives me a good indication, right? Um, and unfortunately, sometimes even not having the right role model at home as a woman, like by the mother per se, mm. doesn't tell you, hey, these are the sort of red flags you got to look into men. Mm. We have a lot of really bad family units, unfortunately, and they just have not been educated. educated. Yep. And um, that's, that's a problem. That is a problem uh, we're facing. And I, I love when we have these discussions because we're allowed to... We're allowed to like identify things that we can work on and we can pass on to to ever whoever's really listening out there. Mm. So, yeah, like that's part of it. I think it's um, relationships are becoming difficult. Mm. We're a small community. We should be focusing on on establishing really good bond with each other. Mm. And one example that I tend to look at are the Coptics. Mm. Uh, I I went to university with them. These kids, they're not the. They may not be the brightest kids out there, right? but they're the most hardworking, and they come together in packs every year. There's a whole club for them at the university. Oh. And there's like probably over 30 of them that are Egyptian, Coptics. Mm. They love the church. They grew up in the church. They're so tight with their um, uh, with their priests, right? Like one of them, um, it's a good friend of mine. We did internship together. And um, he was he was also getting engaged. He was sort of getting into the press of getting engaged and stuff like that. I'm like, dude, like how do you guys stay so tight and why is the divorce rate so low? Bro, once the priest knows we're together, we are fucking counselling with him. Mm. We sit there. 
yeah, with the priest and they have things. they have relationship counseling. Like think? imagine they're priests, they're priests doing that. He's like he sits there with the partners and tells them where you're gonna go wrong, where you're gonna go right, work on this, work on that. They've identified things, and I think those are the sort of communities that we should learn from. Because mm. whatever they're doing, it's working. Mm. Okay. Christian, Muslim, whoever it is, give me those, give me those tools, man. Let's make a difference. Because we're missing out on this, yeah. right? Like, you don't know much about your religion. Mm. You don't know about the men out there. You can't even meet any of them, no, right? Exactly. There's no, there's no like, right sort of opportunities unless you go to a wedding or whatever, mm. right? Which makes your life so much more harder because you're, you're freaking out. Like, hang on, like, am I going to write the, am I going to meet the right person, mm. right? What if I don't? What's going to Like, all these things go through every single person's mind, right? But what if we, have the ability to incorporate those simple tactics. Right? And I think these guys have done an amazing job and I, I, I applaud them for it, honestly. Mm. So yeah. hats, hats down to the men. They figure something out and it, it works well and it's been working well for generations. It's like we're in the community all the time. Or we attend our church every Sunday. Very big on this. Even their youth groups are massive. Huge because their pride comes from their religion. They have a huge pride in their religion over anything else. So I think once we start working on this, somehow re-establishing this faith, I think all these other things will just fall in way easier. And we're not going to have any problems with it. Mm. Hopefully, hopefully. Because I do think that when it comes to, when you talk about youth groups, youth group, no one's there. Like, I don't know why. Is it because families, like, don't, you know, tell their kids to, like, you know, be part of this, be part of that? Or is it because the children themselves don't want to be? Or what is so going on? When was the last time you went? Two years ago, 2022. 2022. 2022. So Back then it was dead. Was it dead and now it's alive? <laughs> it's actually much better now. So they've got, we've got a few things happening. So we've got mm. the Memorial Day, which is like an Andean Memorial Day. So commemorate all our priests that have fallen through the years. And it's more like a, it's like a Remembrance Day, really, for Andeans. Mm. Mm. So we've established that now. We've got a career expo coming up. Not career uh, expo. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So it's people like you should be there. Okay. You guys are the leaders of this sort of stuff, right? Sure, yeah. Um, we used to have a lot of social events. So we'll have parties. It's a good way to meet. We had a, we had a, was it the boat party last year? The year before we had the boat party. Yeah, I think it was 2020. Yeah, that was 2020. That was the one I went to. The boat party? Yeah. Oh, that was good though. <laughs> It was okay. But it was too many, too but many like. Also, not just that. Another thing actually that I should raise. We went to the boat party. As a person who does not know many people in the community, I got no chance whatsoever to actually establish new connections if I wouldn't be so like brave and actually reach out. Yeah, but most of the people were just congregated yeah. in groups. And they knew each other sort of thing. And that's mm. it. So there was no new connections established. I came with my group and I left with my group. The same. Like there was no new... I, I was the one that ran that project at that time. Mm. And the reason why I ran it is because... We worked with a, a, um, a drumming company called A Team. I used to be part of them, mm -hmm. and he pretty much just hired the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, "Dude, that's a good idea. Let's do it." Mm -hmm. so we did the same thing again, and it was a successful event because that was the first event we had after COVID. Mm -hmm. Before that, I rocked yeah. up. I rocked up to a movie event. There was like literally ten people there. Oh. Like, what the fuck? Is that? Where's everyone? <laughs> so then I hit up Michael, and I was like, "Bro, what is going on here?" He's like, "It's been like this for years now." I'm like, fuck. All right, we're gonna get something started. Mm -hmm. So. Me and Daniel got through and we got people coming and then we got the boat party. Mm. And I'll tell you what, that boat party got a whole community out of it. Oh. So we've got things going on, right? But then we realize now that the problem isn't any... any. Sorry, I keep I keep putting an eye on the, on the videos because it, it keeps turning off. Shut, turning off and then I have to re-record. Re um, so it's okay now. So the problem is, is that... Um, we're no longer in need of social events. Mm -hmm. You can do those social events with anyone, yeah. right? We need more like faith-based events. We need things that we can sit down and discuss like problems in the religion and how can we raise awareness of, of problems when it comes to just faith in general. I think that's where we're missing. We're missing that spark. Mm -hmm. Now, I know what you've had mm -hmm. as an experience is the common experience. Mm -hmm. Is that... I don't find people my age or I meet people that are creepy and they're just not my type. And unfortunately, it's because we're just trying to get the ball moving and rolling, right? Which makes things far more difficult to, at times, to, to get the right people meeting. Don't get me wrong, like we've had a few successful marriages out of the mundane youth. 
<laughs> all right, so and then Danny gets a lot of a lot of should like hang off their pictures. <laughs> trust me, we should. It's like a pride moment, man. Like a lot of them, right? So it's not a bad idea because it actually works. The problem is with it is um, how do we make sure that it's not always just social? Because social can only get you because social may attract people that are just having fun and they're drunk, so you're not really meeting them at. at, at Okay. Inappropriate sort mm. of, uh, you know, in, in, in an appropriate sort well, of setting. It's like career expos and stuff like that. Those are very. You're bringing professional people Thank to you. the table. You're bringing people who are ambitious and interested. So that's already a start. So then there you go. That's one thing, right? Mm. What else? What else? What else can you do? What else can you think? You think of that is is a problem right now that we're facing in the communities or in the community from a from a youth perspective that we need to work on. I think it's just you know. Trying to think of creative ways to bring the younger generations together, because every time I see like events happening or like pictures on Facebook mm, and things, mm. I feel like I see the same group of people attending, and that's good. They're devoted, but what about the rest? We must be so many more than just fifteen, twenty people. Yeah, you know what I mean. I can't like say anything because I myself am not attending. Have you rocked up to the Mendy at all? Mm. No, other than for a fat Hano. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like, yeah, I don't know. Somehow we have to try to make it interesting. It doesn't have to be through faith, honestly. Like, I think just initially, just to bring them together in activities, not just games and things, but activities that are like, you know, engaging your brain mm. to show who these people are, their qualities and things like that. And then from there you can start. If people are interested in learning about the religion, you have those groups that are having regular uh, meetings mm-hmm. and to educate True. things. And young people, English speaking, who can take care and lead those groups. But you have to start from trying to first attract them. Trust and me, like you run one event, you attract a particular set of people. You run a different mm-hmm. event, you lose those people. It's yeah. like literally starting a business. Like it's so yeah, hard because there's no there's no continuity. Yeah. There is no there is no like. Uh, just copy this pamphlet, man, and mm. it'll be fine. Like, there's mm. nothing like that, right? Yeah. And the reason being is because people grow up, people have their own responsibilities. It, mm. it becomes far more difficult at times to to be more aware of what works and what doesn't work. Um, like for us, like we're, we're like sort of ancient. You know? like for me, mm. like I don't, I, I don't have the energy um, anymore, and I want to focus on more like these sort of streams where you're throwing it out there I and think, you're attracting I a lot more people already. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing, and I've got the boys who are running their Mandane, I think Mandane podcast as well. Yeah. Uh, we the Mandanes, yeah. We're the Mandanes. Shout I don't know them. if you've come across <laughs> to them, yeah. For Man- we the Mandanes, they just started their podcast as oh, well. Another one. And these guys, yeah, these guys are just focused on the community stuff, right? So honestly, like respect to them, good on them, keep going because they will probably attract a different set of people. I think so, right? Um, and but it's yeah. readily available to everybody. Yeah, so like, even for someone who's like hesitant, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be liking this or whatever. You open the video, you watch, you like it. You're like, oh my God, I want to become friends with these people. And that's how you grow the groups Yeah, bigger. I tell you what, like Through we've had so many de- like people here that are like, this is amazing. Can we get mm. this idea? Can we get this on? And I'm like, mm. man, I'm just throwing a big net. And I'm just, yeah. whatever works, works. Yeah, Some, yeah, yeah. yeah, like, so it's been a very good journey so far. It's very early journey, of course, but it's mm. good because we have people great like you on, right? Mm. So... You've got your own set of skills you're bringing to the table and you've identified weaknesses that we can work on as a community. Mm. But all this aside, let's talk about your passion. Mm. The singing or the acting? Which one is it? <laughs> both at the same time. Yeah, the both. Uh, yeah. So acting was sort of my childhood dream. Cool. Like I started from a very young age, four or five, you would see me. I have all these pictures and videos of Ryan just dressed up in weird things, wearing my mom's clothes and like imitating. And I used to love watching like Arabic series and shows. So that's where I got my passion. Um, And for a long time in my childhood, I just wanted to become an actor. That's it. And then I think singing came along because both of my parents sing. Oh, did they? So I got my voice from them, sort of thing. I mean, we will get you to sing at one point. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so from the age of 13, roughly, that's when I was like, you know what, maybe I want to become a singer as well. And I wanted to become a singer and an actor at the same time. Yeah, it's very common out there, so fair enough. Yeah, Yeah, but... Here we are uh, now, a scientist instead. <laughs> I'm I mean, still doing it, man. But you did. I mean, didn't? If I'm not mistaken, didn't you act on a on a show? Yeah, yeah, just yeah. recently, yeah. 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 Which one was that? House of Gods on ABC. House of House Gods. Of Gods. House of Gods. Should we watch that. It's an Iraqi that. one, like oh, is it? mainly Iraqi. Yeah, I don't know if you know um, Osama Sami. Have you heard of him? He's an actor. actor right? yeah. There's 
a film before that, like a couple of years ago, Osama, Alice Wedding. Os- what was his name? Osama Sami. So, Osama, is that him? Yeah. Is he Iraqi? Yes. Well, that guy does not look fucking Iraqi. Yeah, I know. He's so <laughs> he looks cool. like he looks like <laughs> Turkish or something. He's so cool. Wow. So, how, how did you get in touch with them? Like, how so did you look? I saw. So I already I was already following him on Instagram. Yeah. And for a while, and um, he put up the casting, uh, like call for casting for the show. Mm. So as soon as I saw, it, I was like, "Oh my god!" I mean, bruv. I mean, oh my god. Initially, before, like a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have dared to try. But now I was like, now this is the time, Rania. You the have, to, limit, you have to go That's for it. it. Yeah. Exactly. Good on you, honestly. And yeah. you went to the casting, I guess. I did, yeah, yeah twice. Uh, sort of. Because uh-huh. I got a small role in the... In was the it show. like throughout the whole series or was it like episode? Really? No, so we know which episode, one. We know what, we know episode what episode five, to watch. Episode five. What was the role? Uh, it was a woman. <laughs> uh, Identify as a woman? Second, <laughs> a second wife. <laughs> a second wife, bro. Yeah, a second wife. <laughs> And that's it, yeah. So second wife, and was it like the whole episode you were there? No, no, just literally an appearance, I would say. But Mm -hmm. I got like a speaking appearance. What was it? What did you say? I can't say. I'm not going to say my whole trends like that. (laughs) No, just give us like a snap of it. A snap. Like a snapshot of it. Like what did you say? I was talking to the first wife. You guys bitching? Or just no, like no, actually, we're having pretty, That's, good, we're we pretty good dialogue. <laughs> there was no bitching. Hopefully, if there's a second, um, what's it called, season, maybe. Would you ever act in, like, that was Iraqi accent? Yeah, I was speaking in Arabic. Uh, I mean, hey, to be honest, the best time, the best way to actually become more, especially in the Arabic industry, is just, like, chuck in and just do the Ramadan shows. Mm. A lot of them just travel yeah. to the Middle East and do that. I know, I know. And this is where I'm, like... Would you ever do that? I don't know. I don't think it's possible anymore because just the fact that I've already, you know, immersed myself so much in my career here mm-hmm. and doing a PhD and all that, because that would literally mean you have to drop everything and go. It's usually seasonal. Like I met yeah. people who go for like three, four weeks. Three, four weeks only? If you And, know, if and they record and they yeah. record and they come back. I don't. I think it's longer. If you're gonna become a, like a solid part of no, the no, show, you have to you have to stick around in Dubai or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's what I've been so told. It's a good three four months. Yeah, it's, if it's a serious, yeah, yeah, you stick. But those like comedy shows is like in and out sort of thing, very oh, quickly. Okay. Like yeah, I mean, some of the, some of the Iraqi ones that mm. are popular. Mm. So you just do quickly mm-hmm. three four weeks, mm-hmm. and then come back. And they're like, they pay for your flights and they pay for accommodation. They just give yeah, you off something on top, obviously yeah. for the role. Yeah. But like it's. You've got your foot in, like in the door, so don't mm. lose that. Like mm. honestly, like keep going. I know someone was telling me like, oh, you know, you should send your um, things to like an Iraqi whatever, um, like a show. Because all the, they'll just hit you up. They'll hit you up and be like, hey, like mm. we've got this role. Are you happy? And they'll, they might even send you a bit of the scripts and just have mm. a good look at it. Mm. And you'll go there, but it'll be like hammered like fourteen hours a day, yeah. or like <laughs> like twenty one days or like thirty mm. days. You'll come back cooked. Your brain will be yeah. fried. <laughs> Can't even do science anymore. And like, yeah, and like six months after, you'll be on like Ramadan shows. Oh yeah. So like, I've, 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 you, know, I've, I've you know, I know people that have done that, but the travel is, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, like I don't know, I don't know. I've got too many responsibilities here to. Just how many? Drop how many everything. kids? Um, thirty. <laughs> thirty kids. <laughs> my two parents and my younger brother. <laughs> No, it's great. Honestly, that's yeah. such an amazing. So, and uh, and singing. When did you? St- there was. I've seen this one video that's mm. very popular on on which one on YouTube. On it's YouTube? got like fifty thousand. Oh, that was the uh, professional cover. Professional cover. Uh, yeah. How Everything many covers have you done after that? Before and after. Like normally, I just you know film myself at home singing like a song or whatever and putting it up without music mostly. Mm. But that one was like a proper a studio recording and music. Nice. Yeah. Nice. You, you go welcome to use this studio from now on, man. Like we're gonna put like we're gonna put all the soundproofing and shit, and we can we'll hire we'll hire for like two fifteen hours that way. We, we make some you know, mix, mix. and then and then like you know um, you can hire your friends and stuff and mm-hmm. have a party in here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure thing. No, but it's oh, amazing. Fun. Like it's honestly so great. Are you planning on the new song soon? Uh, not soon. At the moment, I'm just like trying to get my PhD. It is. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's seven days work. Like it's full time. Yeah. Do you guys get paid? So the thing with me at the moment, because I'm a part time worker and yeah. also getting a scholarship, so oh, you can say that I'm a full time worker, sort of thing. Scholarships not bad, not bad. No, they no. tend to together with a part time job, it's it's good. It's good, but mm. scholarship by itself, no, <laughs> it's very little. 
They're pretty limited because most of it is like 20, 30, 40 grand or something. Exactly, yeah. UNSW did put it up actually to 35. Nice. 35, 36, 37 gig. A year? Huh? A year the, for, the, for the year? Yeah, a year. 37 a year. That's like... That's like ten grand. No, no, that's like more like that's like ten grand above the Centrelink. <laughs> <laughs> so you're doing better than the Centrelink. <laughs> there you go. With all due respect to that, you know, it's um, yeah, like a full timer on Centrelink is probably like twenty eight grand or something. But um, it's so hard to get those higher scholarships as well. Yeah, there are some higher ones, actually fifty k, I think, but it, that's top end. How do you get them? Um, you have to really go through like an application process and it depends on the group that you join as well, like how well established are they oh, in the and field sort of and yeah, they yeah. sort of sponsor you to like in your application and things like that. So it's hard. It's not easy to get those. The one that I have is just a basic uni um, scholarship. Also, I had to apply and like show that I am. Do you guys pay tax for that? No. Thank God it's not taxable. Bro. Otherwise, it uh, would be. <laughs> you should get one. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have to do masters at one point, eh? Yeah, but masters, you, there's masters. no scholarships for masters. Oh, masters are so yeah. expensive. I highly discourage anyone who wants to. I'll tell you masters. what I had to go through. Uh, I had to go through medical science. Yeah. And that was like 30K. And I was like, oh, whatever. 30K for what? For like three and a half years of med science. Oh, yeah. Medical science. Yeah, because yeah, I, yeah, kept, trip, I kept yeah. like studying until you, you, know, you get into med. Uh, and then med came through. And that was a full fee position. How much is uh, your full uh, medicine degree? So if you go to Commonwealth supported places, yeah. it's just the standard. It's like 12000 a year yeah. for five or six years. Yeah. But I copped a full fee yeah. position, yeah. which means I had to go through fee help. Mm-hmm. And that was like 150 k And then I had to top up by an extra 200000 <laughs> over five years. <laughs> 350 So Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was a lot in there. So it was around 370000 for five years. Oh. Or four, th- four years and eight months, to be exact. What does is, what is fee help do? So fee help Partial. pretty much gives you master's access, dentistry, medicine. Mm-hmm. So 150, it's, around, it's now around 170,000. It gives you access to the full fee coverage for the positions mm-hmm. because certain PhDs don't have it, mm-hmm. certain master's programs don't have it. So you have to access an entire loan to actually um, cover the whole cover, thing. Cover, cover, cover partially part of it. And for me, it was just like, bro, like, I was doing a lot at that time as well. So I knew if I did not catch on to this opportunity, it's going to yeah. take me a while to get into medicine. I so I was like, fuck yeah. it, whatever. Dad was like, we'll make it work. And we made it work. Mm. And respect to that man, he drove around yeah. in an I, I-30 Kia. And that was it? Kia, was it? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Hyundai I-30 yeah. um, for five years paying off my fees oh. as a driving instructor. Mm. So it was a lot. We went through, um, like... Now, so now it's like we've got this hustler's mindset all the time. It's just like, if you can get through this, mm. you can get through anything. Mm. And that's, that's part of like, you should never, ever give up on, on your passions. Like, keep recording songs. You never know which one's going to go popular. You never know which yeah. one's going to go viral. Then we'll be remembered as interviewing you. And <laughs> <made it. laughs> but sing us something. Give us something. Uh, like Turkish and Iraqi, which will add up to you. Uh, or we can end the episode on that. Do you know? Iraqi since uh, we are a pretty we are out of Iraqi audience. <laughs> we are out of. Go for it. <laughs> so, um, you know, Mehana Mehana? Oh, yes. Yeah? Okay. I like that song. Get your drums ready then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but don't kill the microphone. Go for it. All right. Mehana um, Mehana ميحانا ميحانا غابت شمسنا الحلو ما جانا غابت شمسنا الحلو ما جانا حيك حيك بابا حيك الفرح ما لبيك ذول العذبوني ذول المرمروني وعلى جسر المسيب سيبوني وعلى جسر المسيب سيبوني حلو حلو وبجنة الشام عليه اللي ما نام ترد بيه الخلاك هم عليه اللي ما نام That sounded so much better on the mic. I know, as well. Oh, I told <laughs> like you. Can you see, like, just high on this so stuff, good. man. <laughs> Amazing. Honestly, it's absolutely. Yeah. Like, I encourage every woman to to model her life like you did honestly good on you Thank phd you. traveling around doing everything even half the, like the recording cut out but we've got everything out of it <laughs> <laughs> but honestly it's been a pleasure 
Thank, thank you, you so you. much for being here. Thank now, you so last much. word, we have something called the word of wisdom. So mm-hmm. Every, every um, I guess, visitor or every, uh, every uh, guest that comes on mm-hmm. gives us their word of wisdom that they would love to leave behind or future generations for people that are listening. What would be yours? Uh, mm, it just basically be a good human and always aim for the best and aim for the sky that's it cool it's powerful man be the best <laughs> man yeah, shut up and be the best that's it <laughs> <laughs> love it thank you so much thank right you again. for having me uh, it's been a pleasure and i'm pretty sure we'll probably have you again 100%, yeah. with more discussions I'll and more girls and it'll be like yeah let's <laughs> see what a lot of stuff yep. <laughs> nah i'm awesome all right guys Peace out. I think I want like less than 5%, so we should end it. (laughs) All right, thanks.